Welcome back. Our workshop is on macroeconomic implications of decarbonization policies and actions. Again, I'm Sonia Carley from the University of Pennsylvania. I will once again uh, offer a few introductory remarks to the day in a moment, but first I'll turn it over to Katrina Hoy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today for the second day of our workshop. Oh, Annie, can you please go to the next slide? Great, so I'm just gonna give a friendly reminder for those who are joining us today, both in person and virtual, we encourage you to join us on Zoom. Uh, this makes for the best type of hybrid meeting. For those in person, please connect to the Zoom using the information provided in the agenda. And um, please ensure that your computer speakers are off. Um, and also uh, when it asks you to join the audio, just decline and continue to decline throughout the day. Um, for those who are joining virtually, please mute yourself when you're not speaking to support a distraction-free discussion space. And for all participants, um, as a reminder, we're focusing all the comments and questions on Slido, which we have the QR codes around the room, and we'll be sharing the link throughout the day in the Zoom chat. If you need any help, you can use the Zoom chat for any technical difficulties. And we encourage those, if you're comfortable, to please turn on your camera to support a sense of community throughout this hybrid meeting. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we have a policy for expectations for conduct, and we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identity-based factors. Um, and so if you witness or would like to say anything, you can always email me, which is on my emails on the event page, or you can also email HR at National Academies. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'm going to pass back to Sonia. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm just going to take a moment to review what we did yesterday. This was our agenda. For those of us who are tuning in afresh this morning, I'm sorry that you missed this fabulous lineup. We had opening keynotes with Steve and Nat. We had a panel on economic risks and opportunities. And we had a panel on the barriers to decarbonization and solutions. And we ended the day with a robust poster session, both virtual and in person. And then we came back together and debriefed on some of the key themes. I'm just going to take a moment to highlight some of these themes. These are, are more or less uh, my own interpretations and my own opinions of, of some of the things that we talked about yesterday. We talked about there are a range of risks associated with decarbonization pathways. These include financial risks, social risks, political risks in particular. And although these risks by their nature are defined as uh, being highly adverse and highly uncertain, there is a certain degree of predictability and understanding of how these risks might shape out. And thereby, we highlighted that it is important to build in processes so that we predict those risks early on, or that we're able to address them rather. And arguably the time to address the risks is now. We then talked about barriers and the barriers to decarbonization, I think are, are formidable. And we are seeing many of them play out in real time across the United States and across the world. Barriers include, but are not limited to institutional incongruence and governance challenges, behavioral limitations, interconnection cues, citing challenges, and the political will and the pendulum of election, uh, election cycles. Yet, we ended at the end of the day uh, with a discussion about how there are actually pathways for addressing these barriers and circumventing these risks. And we highlighted a really positive note, ended on a positive note, which I, of course, love, uh, that the research and policymaking and practitioner community is designing practical and pragmatic solutions in real time to some of these challenges, and that it's a real pleasure that we can come together and digest these together. So here's today, this is our plan for the day. We will once again begin with an opening keynote today from Kate Calvin. We will then have two panels back to back. The first is on incorporating modeling insights into policy design. And the second is on the global interactions. That will be followed by lunch. And then we will have a series of interactive breakout sessions. Now these breakout sessions are both virtual as well as in person. And some of the themes, the themes, the four themes that we will highlight today, one is stakeholders. The second is research and policy synergy. The third is regional differences and barriers. 
And the final is academic engagement and global decarbonization. We will then all come back together, report back, and finally wrap up the session. Uh, I'll just remind us once again that we have the Slido. Uh, it's really great to see your questions coming in, to see your thumbs up. It really helps us as moderators get a sense of what the room is interested in hearing about. A reminder, you can use the QR codes on the table. You can use uh, the QR code on this PowerPoint if you're tapping in virtually, or you can just go to slido.com and enter macro decarb. I'll go ahead now and turn it over to Jay to moderate our, our first session. Thanks, Anya. Um, so in this first session, uh, we're going to have our opening keynote uh, from uh, Kate Calvin. Um, our goal for today's opening keynote is to consider what our current challenges for modeling decarbonization and energy transitions. And Kate will reflect on the strengths and weaknesses of current models, decarbonization, and energy transition. And give us her thoughts on uh, where and how these models uh, can be improved. Uh, we've allocated 15 minutes, so she gets more time than any of the keynote speakers yesterday uh, for her remarks. Uh, and I will let her know when there's one minute remaining. Uh, but uh, before I, I give her the floor, uh, I just uh, wanna say it's a distinct pleasure to have the honor of introducing Kate. Uh, she's someone I've known for many years and have had the pleasure of working with uh, over that time. Uh, she is currently uh, NASA's chief scientist and senior climate advisor to the administrator. Uh, since uh, 2022, uh, she advises agency leadership on the agency's science programs and science-related strategic planning and investments. Uh, and uh, in July of last year, she undertook the co-chair responsibilities for working group three of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Seventh Assessment. And for those of you who have not been engaged in this, I want to say that this is one of the world's toughest jobs. Uh, and I already feel in Kate's debt. Uh, so... Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what Kate has to say, and uh, let me just turn the floor over to her. Thank you, Jay, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here yesterday. Um, I tried to get a quick recap from Jay on what you guys talked about, um, but I unfortunately couldn't be here um, or listen to it, um, but I'm happy to be here today. Um, so I kept the title that I was given in the agenda, but um, as Jay mentioned, what I'm gonna talk about is um, on modeling decarbonization, including what models currently do, as well as challenges and opportunities going forward. And what I'm gonna use to do this, I'm gonna focus um, predominantly Predominantly on the IPCC's sixth assessment report. As Jay mentioned, I was elected last year as co-chair of IPCC's working group three, um, and that's where a lot of this content um, came in the last assessment cycle. So I'll show what was done there um, and highlight some areas um, in the future. I'm also going to give an example from my NASA role to explain how things go from uh, research development deployment um, and how those are represented into models. So just getting started, um, this is a figure from the IPCC's um, sixth assessment report from working group three, and it's showing um, emissions pathways into the future, um, focusing on progress, gaps, and challenges. And so what you're looking at, I'll just focus on the main panel. The others are just showing you snapshots in time to make it um, easier to see the, um, the differences. But the main panel, you've got different lines. So the red line is trends from implemented policies, then you have the green and the light blue lines are pathways towards 1.5 or 2 degrees um, starting immediately. Um, and then this darker blue line is what happens if you follow um, the nationally determined contributions in the near term and then try to get to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees in the longer term. So looking at if you follow near term policies and then you get there. And what you can use a figure like this for is to understand these gaps and challenges. So what is the difference between nationally determined contributions, which are countries' pledges for emissions reductions, and what it would take to get to 1.5 or 2 degrees? What are the differences between policies that are actually in place 
um, and those nationally determined contributions. And I should say, when you're looking at this, recognize that this report was published in early 2022. So it does not reflect policies and actions that have been taken since then, including large policies that have been implemented in large countries. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at it. The point I'm trying to make here is less about the quantitative, but more about what the models can do. So they can help you understand these differences between policies, um, pledges, and, um, and where we might go. Um, and so then you can also look behind the scenes of these. So this is looking at greenhouse gas emissions. We could look at carbon dioxide versus methane, what's, in, what's happening in those pathways. You could look at the sectoral transitions that happen to lead to these emissions. So looking at how the energy system um, transitions would look to, um, to underneath an emissions pathway like that. We can look at all of those things. We can look at different milestones like net zero, um, either net zero greenhouse gas or net zero carbon dioxide from these pathways. So these are pathways generated by a set of models, um, global models, um, we're the only ones included in that. Um, and in the IPCC's sixth assessment report, there is a box that explains those models. And I've only copied the first par paragraph on that. This is a multi-page box um, and I recommend reading it all, um, but I'm copying the first one because the first paragraph is really about the models and then it gets into details of how those scenarios and the assessment. Um, but what I wanna point out here in these models I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to point out a few different parts of it. First, these are projections, not predictions or forecasts. So they are looking at what if this, what would happen? Um, and so th that's important. And sometimes people think about it as, is it a prediction? But it's not. It's a projection. There's no likelihood ascribed to any one of those scenarios. We can't say this is the path we're most likely on. We're saying this is a path we could be on um, and what it would look like. Second thing. About half of the models assume least cost approaches or cost effective approaches or least cost abatement. That means they're probably putting in a carbon price or an emissions constraint, typically globally. So they're assuming a cost effective approach for the economists in the room. You could probably understand why you might do that. It's also as a modeler, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward thing to put into a model. Um, and so those are half of them are doing that. Um, and that means that they're not really differentiating what is happening in each individual country. There is another half that does look at existing policies and regional or sector differentiated action. So looking at what you might put in a policy in an individual country, doing that in every region of the world, and then seeing where you might get. Third thing I want to point out, most of these models or scenarios do not make explicit assumptions about equity, environmental justice, or intra-regional income distribution. We're showing you global results. Behind those global results are regional is regional information, but most of these scenarios did not make explicit assumptions about equity, and you won't find much text in the Working Group 3 IRS6 SPM about the implications for equity or about how alternative potential future pathways in terms of inter or intra-regional equity might play out in terms of the, the, the results. Um, there were regionally differentiated assumptions, but they tend to be more on the, um, the current state of the world, and in some cases, the technology availability or cost in the future, less so on, um, on, on other factors. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say in this, in the, in the working group three, uh, air six, um, they've categorized scenarios based on temperature. So they looked at temperature in 2100, the likelihood of that warming, um, and whether or not there was overshoot in, in advance. So did you exceed 1.5 prior to 2100 and by how much? They did not categorize on other um, uh, areas of, um, of the modeling. And, and you could think about many other ways of categorizing scenarios. They focused on temperature. So one of the things that they've done, um, so that's you know showing these pathways and we can look at all of the details behind them, but one of the questions, and this is related to what you guys talked about yesterday, you talked about barriers to mitigation. In the IPCC world, we often talk about that in the terms of feasibility. So what you know what is feasible and, and what are the barriers to um, deploying um, or enablers to it? Um, and so this is a paragraph just sort of summarizing the feasibility assessment in um, working group three, they did an option by option feasibility assessment. So they looked at what is the feasibility of something like solar or wind or going technology by technology. Um, and what they found, first of all, is you know there's 
there are many mitigation options which are feasible to deploy at scale in the near term. So that we have a lot of options available. Um, some of these are, you know, th that have reduced barriers and increased public acceptance. They're lower cost than they used to be. And so they go through some of those. They also talk about some of these barriers um, and they, they categorize them by geophysical, environmental, ecological, technological, economic, institutional and social cultural factors. And so going through each of those, and I'll, on the next slide, I'll give a little bit more context behind what some of those might mean um, in, in, in terms of um, specifics. But I think just wanna highlight a few things that they said. First of all, feasibility differs across sectors and regions according to capacities and the speed and scale of, of uh, implementation. So something might be feasible to do small or slow, but then as you're going faster and more, um, you, you reach more of these challenges. And those challenges do vary from region to region and sector to sector. Almost all mitigation options face institutional barriers. Um, so that was one thing that they found is that the institutional barriers there. Um, when you're thinking about how you model these, you know, some of these barriers are, are pretty straightforward to incorporate in models. Others are harder to assess. So some of the geophysical and technological, those are direct parameters in a model. You can just put in things like the potential for a particular resource that's in, captured in the models already. Some of these others are more challenging to incorporate in models. But there was um, an assessment in there of the feasibility of pathways. So looking at what was represented in the models, what those pathways I showed on the first slide um, in, in, in included in terms of energy transition, land use transition, um, or other factors, and what does it mean in terms of feasibility? And so this is a, slide, uh, a figure, it's only in the technical summary, it did not appear in the final summary for policymakers, on the feasibility of scenarios. And I'm just focusing in on 2050. Um, there is information on 2030 and 2100, and it would look very different. Um, but just to sort of highlight what they did. And what they've done here, what you're seeing is those five different types of barriers across the bottom. So geo, um, geophysical, then technological, economic, social culture, and institutional. And then the colors are going, plausible is really about, you know, within, sorry, is it, feedback. Um, <laughs> so it, plausible means within the range of values that we've either seen in history or peer reviewed assessments. So this is something that people have said, you know, this has either been done before um, or is in a peer reviewed assessment. Best case scenario is in the range of values that assume sort of a breakthrough in support or technology, but, you know, um, and then unprecedented is going beyond what has been observed or reported in peer review. And so that's how they've kind of categorized these here. Um, just to give a sense of what they looked at in terms of specific quantitative you know, indicators to assess the feasibility. I'm not going to go through the full list, but again, in this geophysical, it's really about biomass, solar, wind potential, something that is, uh, is a concrete physical factor that we can assess. Technological, they looked at the scale up. So what's the percentage increase in share or the total amount of something done in a year? For economic, they use in economic indicators like GDP loss or carbon price, um, investments, stranded assets, and use those as indicators. For sociocultural, they got at they use, looked at percentage decreases in demand predominantly. So trying to get you know trying using that as an indicator of a sociocultural change, uh, so kind of an indicator of behavioral change needed. Um, and then institutional um, things on governance levels and per capita carbon dioxide were the indicators used in this. Um, and you hear in that some of these are very quantitative. There is a you know physical liter uh, science literature on it. Others are a little more qualitative. We have to think about what does it mean? How do we measure this? And what does it mean to be plausible or, or unprecedented within there? Um, and this you know this, when you're thinking about how you model these, anything that has a physical quantitative component to it is usually easy to represent in a model because you and models are quantitative. You need to put in a quantitative indicator. But if you want to put in some of these other types of barriers and incorporate them directly in the model, then you would need to think about how to quantify something that could be subjective or qualitative in there. And so what was done here was rather than putting it into the model in advance, it was looking at the outputs of the model and trying to determine which of these um, exceed these feasibility. So I want to switch now just to an, a concrete example on what happens when you're going from research to development to deployment using um, aviation, and I'm going to use this NASA example here. Um, and so this is just text that I will not read from the IPCC's Working Group 3 on aviation and shipping, and it talks about sort of the potential 
for um, reducing emissions in aviation or shipping. And for those that aren't familiar, they're not a large fraction of emissions today, but they're viewed as hard to abate. There's a limit to the technology options that are available there. And so when you get into these 1.5 and 2 degree pathways into the future, they end up taking a larger portion of the remaining emissions because they're hard to abate. Um, so what we do at NASA, so um, NASA, the first A in NASA is aeronautics, and we look at and we worked with the aviation industry for decades to reduce energy use and emissions in aircraft. Um, there's three different areas. One is around aircraft design, and so you see in this image, if you look out the window of your plane, you'll see the wing curves up. That comes from NASA research. It reduces drag, which means less energy use and emissions. So uh, what we focus on is, you know, reducing the environmental impact of flying if you choose to fly. Um, and so in aircraft design, we have efforts going on into the future about looking, continuing to look at aircraft design, including wing design, in order to continue this reducing energy use and drag. Um, we also work in the areas of airport operations. There's a lot, when you're at the gate, you're on, you're not using the jet engine. You're plugged in to power from the airport. Um, and so it's electricity and, you know, it, it's um, how much emitting is depends on your electric grid. Once you back away from the gate, you're on a jet engine. Um, and so one of the things we've looked at is, can you optimize when you back away from the gate so you spend less time on the tarmac and then you're using less fuel? Um, and so they've done a pilot at the Charlotte airport and it's now being transitioned um, into, uh, into FAA, which would be the ones that would roll it out. You also look into fuels. So if you really wanna go to a, a more closer to a zero carbon, you can think about, there are examples of all electric um, um, research going on for very small aircraft. There's hybrid electric research um, to improve efficiency. And you'll also hear people talk about hydrogen. When you're talking about any one of those, there's a technology portion of that. Can we develop a technology that works, is safe, is reliable, and, and reduces emissions? And that's the part that NASA tends to focus on. We're the research and development part, and it's decades of research to get into any one of those changes. But if you want people to use it, you have to get it to the people that are either in the industry deploying or in the operational capacity. So for the airport operations, that would be FAA. That takes another step of time. It's getting that out there and moving it into the fleets. And so those take a lot of, um, can take some, quite a bit of time. And that's all for what we would call a drop-in fuel. So a fuel that you already have infrastructure to put at your airport. If you're thinking about something like- One minute. Um, like hydrogen, you also need an infrastructure behind that. And that's different people. And so you've got multiple actors, multiple um, points in time. And all of this is rolled up into a model, often in a single parameter. What is your efficiency, maybe your efficiency and your cost at a single moment in time? And so we have to think about all of that is behind that. It can create barriers along the way. It can create opportunities. When we represent that in the model, we often do that in a, um, in a, in a much more um, simple manner because of the, the nature of the models. So the last thing I'll do with my 30 plus seconds left is just talk about um, sustainable development. And this is just getting at what you're talking about today. So I think today's focus is really about, you know, can models provide insight into policy and what are global implications? And I think one of the primary ways we can do this is when we think about sustainability. And so one of the areas that people in the modeling world are thinking about is when we mitigate, what is the effect on jobs, on water scarcity, on food security? And I think the models can help us provide insight and, and understanding where those things might go in different directions. And also these are areas where what you do in one country might have implications in others. And so there are these global implications for that. Um, and since I'm out of time, I won't provide any concrete examples here, but thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was great. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, that uh, Slido is available so that we can get uh, this conversation started and, and uh, take advantage of the fact that we have Kate here. Um, and uh, so please uh, use the Slido. Uh, don't use the chat. Uh, it's going nowhere. Uh, and uh, it, if you use the Slido, it's coming directly in, into the room. Um, while we wait for uh, people to uh, bring uh, questions to the floor, maybe take a, a couple of minutes to finish that, your thoughts on that final mm -hmm. slide. And so what, the only thing I was going to say on that was just, you know, like when we're representing this, sometimes in the models, we can put some of these sustainability constraints into the model directly. Other times what we might see is like, if you put in this particular future scenario, you get a new challenge here. And I think there's some insights we can learn. And then I think the only last thing I would say in bringing together both 
this last part on sustainability and global implications and the first part on feasibility is often when we think about this, there are a lot of really detailed national or sectoral models that can help us understand feasibility and barriers to mitigation and understand those challenges. Um, but they're national or sectoral. If you want to understand some of these global implications, you need these global models. And I think a question for me is how do we bring those together so that we can get that detail needed to understand barriers and where we might be going and that global interconnectedness that we need to understand the implications in one region for another. Great. So um, I'm going to take advantage of being the chair uh, and uh, just throw a question in uh, to the mix uh, myself. Uh, and that first question that I'd like to get your thoughts about uh, is uh, what's the highest priority for the modeling community uh, to improve the quality of the uh, of the information that we're delivering to decision makers and and maybe who do we think of as the the uh, primary decision makers that we want to inform? That's a great question. And we did actually, the IPCC had a, um, an expert workshop on this about a year ago, because this was the question of where can we go? And it was focused not just on, on scenarios in general, both modeled and non-modeled. And they came out with a bunch of recommendations for different parts of this. So recommendations to the modeling community about things to represent included a lot on a discussion around equity. Um, and a lot, you know, I think people are interested in this how question, um, not just the what. There were also recommendations to the IPCC on how to assess this information, including how do you bring together different types of information um, and how do you present that so it's maybe not just categorized by temperature. And then there were a lot of recommendations on the communication. And I would say this is one of the things I think we have to think about is how do we communicate what we've done? And I think it starts with the modeling community of you know, clearly communicating to your audiences what is in the models, what is not in the models, what's in the scenarios, what's not in the scenarios, what might change if you made a different assumption. And then that can go through, like the IPCC can capture those and communicate it to policymakers. Because often I think people don't necessarily know um, the completeness of what's in there or what's not in there. Great. Um, so the first question that seems to have a lot of likes uh, is, uh, uh, it was striking in the AR6 figure you showed about how unprecedented institutional changes dominated the chart. Could you expand on this and on ensuing both research and policy needs? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think, you know, in both the in the, in both in the figure I showed, but also in the text that's in the um in the in the AR6 assessment, it, it mentions that all mitigation options face institutional challenges. An institution is kind of capturing how do you set up and um in governance and those sorts of things. Some of the indicators they used in that figure were around, you know, emissions per capita or governance indicators, um, but there are definitely challenges around that. Um, when you're thinking about going forward, how do you implement those policies and what sorts of institutions do you need to, to, to do that? Great. Um, so uh, the next question that's uh, coming to the, uh, the top is, uh, how can we better assess the feasibility of policy technology options in the long term since what we decide to do in the near term can change the feasibility of them in the future? <laughs> That is a great point. Um, and at least in the in the pathways, they did do feasibility assessments. I showed 2050. They also have it for 2030 and 2100. And one of the points that they make is that what might have higher feasibility challenges in the near term could have lower in the long term and vice versa. And you'll often hear there's some very specific examples around that where you want to do something in the long term. The more you do now, the easier that is then. Um, and so, the, you know, you, you do have to think about that across time. Um, and th this is where I think doing this sort of what if scenario analysis can be really helpful. Like, what if we do this now? Would that help in the long term and assess that as a temporal pathway? Because it does change very much across time. And some of that has to do with scale of deployment. So the, you know, scale and speed of deployment were one of the indicators of feasibility. And so if you go slower to get to the same level, you're going to have a different set of feasibility challenges than if you go faster to get to that level. But some of it has to do with what you invest in now and where, where it takes it in the future. Great. So um, I think we're following along this, the, this, you know, sort of going into this uh, vein of, of, um, investigation. 
so the next uh, next slide is I love the inclusion of behavior in social science. Uh, can you offer examples of best practices in terms of interdisciplinary modeling approaches that engage social behavioral science input? And where did you see this work especially well? I think this is a great question and it's an active area that I think both research is happening and also more potential for the future. One of the things coming out of that expert meeting I mentioned was they actually cut, um, talked about social sciences explicitly and also modeled and non-modeled information. And within the social sciences, you have both. Um, and how do you bring those together? And I think that's a really important question for um, for the science community, for the IPCC, um, and even the, na the sixth national climate assessment has some chapters related to this coming up. And so I think there's some really important areas there. There are some examples of doing this, and I'd say I've seen two different types of examples. One is where you have social scientists look at the outputs of a model and try to understand, are there challenges like that? And that's related to what we saw in that feasibility figure is it was not incorporated into the model, but you brought in social scientists afterwards to reflect on what does this mean? There's another part where you can uh, include it in the model itself, and there's different ways of doing that. I would say for some sorts of behavioral changes, the way modelers do it is it's either in or out. Um, you can't actually model the diffusion of that change. You in instead do one scenario where you include it and one where you don't, and you compare, and you can work with a social scientist to understand what that change is. But then there is some efforts, um, a lot of, I've seen some European papers where they're bringing social scientists into their modeling projects and trying to think about what parameters might, uh, might you change to represent that. And now that I'm looking at some of the people in the audience, it's also being done here as well. And so I think there is an effort now to bring in social scientists into the modeling world and think about well, in my area of political science or economics or behavior or social culture or change, how do I represent that in a model? And maybe we'll hear more about it later today. <laughs> so um, the next question, which I think is uh, one that I actually have, um, uh, and it, it is, what's the working definition of feasible, uh, given that the technologies have potentially very large institutional, technological, and economic barriers how do we operationalize that notion that we all have, but isn't you know, particularly technical? <laughs> Yeah, this is a great question. And I will say first, there is an official IPCC glossary definition around feasible. I do not have it memorized, so I will not read it out. Um, but it goes through the factors, essentially that feasibility isn't one thing, it's multidimensional. You might have technological feasibility is different than economic or social culture, and it goes through those different things. But I will say it's still, you know, there's also some, um, some consideration in the literature about is feasible in a model is different than feasible in the real world. And so model feasibility is, does it solve? And that's probably an indicator of real world feasibility. If your model doesn't solve, it's probably telling you something, um, but that is different. And so I think one of the things is, you know, how do, there is there was a conversation at some of these expert meetings I've been to about what does feasible mean? How does it relate to plausible? Um, and how do we define it in a, you know, in a quantitative manner? You know, it's different to define something in a qualitative manner, but how do you do it in a quantitative way? Yeah. Um, so this is a thread that we had in the conversations yesterday, and I, um, I think it's a really important one. Uh, and, and the question starts, um, for policymakers, the term barriers, uh, particularly in institutional and sociocultural, uh, is a tough way to communicate. Right? How do we reframe uh, to integrate these into something that indicates there are both answers and opportunities? That is a great question. And I think, first of all, you know, I think when we often talk about it, I talked about it in the context of barriers because that was the way it was framed, I think, largely in the agenda item yesterday. Um, <laughs> but we also, in, in, in the science community and in the IPCC, we talk about barriers and enablers. There are also things that are enabling, things that, you know, in some of these sustainable development dimensions, there's a lot, there's plenty of options in the future that would, you know, reduce emissions and improve air quality. And that can be an enabler because it's it's benefiting something um, more in society. Um, and so I think we do need to think about how we communicate in general. So a lot of what I showed was pretty technical language um, and that's fine for a technical audience, but when you're talking to uh, policymakers, the general public, how do you relate it to them? Um, and I think specific examples can be helpful, but we have to be careful about specific examples because one of the things we did learn here is that barriers and enablers vary by region um, and by sector. And so not all examples would be applicable in all places. Great. Um, well, I think I'm going to save the uh, next most popular question for the end. Um, 
so I'm going to move to the second most popular question. Uh, and the second most popular question is, what policy questions do you see that face the largest modeling challenges? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know that I have a concrete answer to that. I think I would actually probably turn that back to the science community um, as the modeler de developers and people that are looking out and sort of identifying, you know, what do you think is challenging and how can we either communicate what we can and can't do um, or improve the model? So I, I don't think I have a concrete answer to that. <laughs> that is a tough question. And in part, I think, uh, depends on exactly what questions the models are being asked to answer. Yes. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, so um, I was surprised that the uh, socio-cultural challenge had a strong feasibility component in the chart on challenges. Could you talk a little more about what is included in that measure? Yeah, and so I will say that um, <laughs> <laughs> that figure, there's a lot of technical detail behind it. I'm going to look up exactly. So what they looked at in there, and I don't, um, some of the indicators that were captured in there were percentage decrease in energy demand, percentage change in dietary mix, um, and percentage change in land cover. And these were just indicators. Um, and I think the question is, you know, what are the right indicators and what do these indicators mean? And so what they were trying to get at there are, what are things where it is something that would change? It's not economic, it's not necessarily technological, but it would impact people's lives um, or would be, require a decision made by people. Um, and so that's what they're trying to capture there. But again, these in indicators are largely dependent on what was available from the models. And so I think that's actually a question is, you know, how do we define this? Um, how do we model this? And how do we represent this as indicators? Great. So um, I like this question. Uh, what keeps you up at night when you think about modeling challenges? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I would say one of the things for me is both, um, is, is communication of it because I don't, you know, as a modeler that often interacts with non-model or a former modeler, I should say, um, interact with, um, <laughs> with non-modelers, both as- You're disavowing us. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, both, you know, non, and I, I interact with policymakers, I interact with scientists from, you know, physical science, um, technology developers, um, people don't always know what's in these models and what's not. And I think it's hard to understand. And I'm not sure, you know, in some of the language I showed here, it's still very technical. Um, and so trying to explain what we are able to do and not. And also, I think in some cases, we can say we don't do this, but do, but we what we don't always aren't always able to explain is would it change the answer? Uh, and I think that's what we need to understand is if we're not representing something, is it because we don't know how to yet? Is it because it would have a big impact, um, but we don't, we haven't gotten there? Or is it because it wouldn't actually change the results we're looking at? And I think that's something people need to know. It's, you know, it's one thing to say what's in and what's out, but it's an, the next step is, would it change? And what would it change? And so I worry a lot about can people, do people understand the information we're giving them and how do we make that easier to understand? Okay, so I'm gonna squeeze one more penultimate question in. Okay. Um, I looked up the feasibility issues from the technical appendix and saw the 2030 effects. It shows that the economic challenges are different across methods in 2030 and then very similar in 2050. Can you talk about What's going on there? Um, and do you have a sense of why? So what I'll say, so I can't answer comprehensively for everything that's different between 2030, 2050, and 2100. So what I'll do though is give a concrete example of this. Um, so one of the things that you will see in, in different pathways there is, is, when, um, is how quickly you reduce emissions. So you can get to the same temperature level by reducing emissions very, very fast and then staying at a low level for a while. Or you can do a more gradual, because what matters for climate is the cumulative emissions, right? So there's more than one pathway to get to the same amount of cumulative emissions. Those would have different temporal feasibility challenges. And reducing emissions very rapidly in the near term is going to put some feasibility and, um, and, and, and challenges in the, in the very near term, because you're trying to do something very quick. But once you get there, it's less, um, less challenges. On the alternative, if you are sort of taking a different 
you know, a more gradual decline in the near term and a more rapid later, you've shifted those challenges into the to the mid middle term. So that's just one example of how, of why why these would shift. Um, but you know, to know comprehensively for every single like, I, I would have to go back into the the underlying um, models. Great. Um, so uh, I want to. Uh, this is the question I've been saving. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and it requires you to uh, have your um, uh, your your forecaster hat on, uh, and it uh, it is. Uh, can you comment on whether the AR seven models will look uh, different uh, than those in AR six? And what do you expect the new things to be coming down the pike? Okay. Uh, short answer, yes. Um, so I will say um, I get invited to a lot of uh, meetings by the scientific community to hear what they're doing um, and for me to give them some information about IPCC, which is just getting underway. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of like people, people took some of these challenges that were identified in AR6 very seriously and are working towards them. So there are a lot of efforts looking into equity now um, and trying to not just within a global model, but also bringing more modeling frameworks into the, the picture. So there's, a, there's an effort going on now to reach um, out to um, national models and, and models in different countries. There are some efforts to, um, you know, to capture some of these, um, these factors that we have, like the social science, there's an emerging literature, you know, it's, it didn't start after AR6, but we're getting more and more papers that are looking into how do you incorporate social science. So I do think we're going to have more, um, but how much more kind of depends on all of you. Um, so as, as IPCC, <laughs> all I do is assess the literature. As NASA, you know, we're in a technology development phase. And so um, I think it's up to the scientific community how much different things look, but we're looking forward to seeing it. Great. Well, uh, I've run past the end of the session, uh, but uh, let's give uh, Kate a round of applause. Thank you so much, Kate. So, and thank all of you for some great questions, uh, not easy questions, but great questions. Um, so uh, with that, let me round this up. Uh, our next session, um, which is going to be on incorporating modeling insights into policy design, um, brings uh, back Mark and Diego, uh, who are going to uh, uh, find, uh, take us through uh, this next session. So I'll turn the floor over to Mark and Diego. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mark Hafstead, a resource for the future with Diego uh, from Northwestern. We're going to moderate this uh, session on incorporating modeling insights into policy design. Um, so this panel discussion, we're going to hear from experts on incorporating model insights into actionable granular climate policy design. We're going to hear from a variety of modeling perspectives, uh, such as energy system designs, macroeconomics, global perspectives, and what models are able and not able to do, uh, and what are our opportunities to improve existing models, develop complementary approaches, and or create new ones. So I'm kind of thinking we're, we want to look at what do we know and what do we don't know, and what do we know we really don't know, <laughs> <laughs> um, and how we can use that to better inform uh, policy design using uh, um, economic and energy system models. Um, so as we've done yesterday, we're going to have a series of five-minute flash talks, and I'm going to give a one-minute cue before the time is up. And then once all the speakers have gone, we're going to have the larger 40-minute group Q&A. And again, if you have a question at any time, please submit them via Slido, and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so we have four speakers today. Uh, we have a great lineup. Uh, we're going to start with uh, committee member uh, Wei Peng. 
Uh, she's, for you guys who don't know her, she's an assistant professor of public and international affairs and the Adlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. And so she's gonna kick us off with her remarks. Great, thank you. So I'll use my five minutes to talk about integrating political economy insights into integrated assessment models. But putting on my planning committee member hat a little bit, I wanna start by connecting our session with Kay's talk just now and also the session yesterday. Next slide, please. So it has become clear through the conversation that there is a model world and there's a real world. They're not always connected. And if you're really looking at what happens in the model is that we usually magic is going to happen and with a policy action, there's a, some metrical straight line emission reduction that's going to occur. But the real world is much more complex than that. And to some extent, this is because when we're thinking about policy action in the real world, we need to thinking about the feasibility of policy adoption, implementation, and behavioral response. Let's take the Inflation Reduction Act as an example. It's a great example to say that, hey, subsidies are actually more politically feasible than uh, 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 carbon tax to get adopted in this country. But now we have the IRA. We have the second question now, which is implementation. How can federal, state, and local actors implement IRA program in a more effective way? We also have the behavioral problem as we discussed yesterday. We have a bunch of cre tax credits, but are people going to use them and start to getting more heat pumps and electric cars? So given this disconnect between the model world and the real world, how can we improve policy realism in models? Next slide, please. So most of my own thinking in this space is focused on detailed process integrated assessment models. So in case you're not familiar with what this, this kind of I am, they usually start with exhaustion assumptions about GDP, population, and policy assumptions. So in the near term, we can put in current policy, but in the long term, especially net zero, it's usually modeled as an emission target and or a carbon price. And then all these exhaustion assumptions are going to a core model where the interaction between economy, energy, land, and climate system is going to be simulated. And finally, coming out of the model, we get the economic outcome, emissions, energy pathway, et cetera. Next slide, please. I, I do think that even within the model structure of the IAM, there are a lot of room for us to make models more realistic. The key question is where to prioritize. And in my view, we should prioritize model advancement that are both politically important and computational tractable. And let me just give you a concrete example here. Let's just focus on the policy based on carrots and sticks. So we can improve scenario design. For example, we can design scenarios with carrots or sticks, but we can transition from carrots to sticks over time. We could also conduct an ex post analysis. For example, we can assess who are the winning versus losing sectors or states or even segments of population from carrots and how they differ from sticks. But we could also really push ourselves harder to thinking about, can we start to encode those processes? For example, Jonas Macklin mentioned yesterday about policy sequencing. So can we start to incorporate that process to say that if we have carrots today, how this is going to change our technology cost as well as green coalition building as a result making future stakes hopefully more feasible. I do want to emphasize that even though we have a lot of options, as we go from one to two to three, we're really asking a much deeper integration between the modeling community and the social sciences. So David Victor mentioned our joint project yesterday. So we do have a project right now where we have half of the team as a modelers, half of the team as social and political scientists, and we try to do all one, two, and three and see what we can learn. Next slide, please. But I also want to emphasize that IAM is just like one of many computational tools we have. And there's a lot of value for us to explore model comparison and coupling opportunities. So recently we did a study where we put together an integrated assessment modeler, which is me, and also an energy system optimization modeler, as well as an agent-based modeler. And what we did is that let's come together thinking about the tools we have and how can we better simulate institutional heterogeneity. And what we find is that really different models are good at represent different kinds of institutions and different One minute. factors. Um, as a result, there's a lot of value for us to thinking about what is the right kind of question we have in mind. As a result, what is the right modeling approach for us to do that? Last slide. Great. Just to quickly recap, 
To me, I think within IAM, the question is where to prioritize. And beyond IAM, the question is how can we explore model coupling and comparison opportunities? But in order to do so, I do want to highlight the question that we, we already talked about during case session, that we really need a deeper collaboration between the modeling and the political economy communities. I do see this community growing, but I think there's a lot more can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. You're doing a great job of keeping on time for our first speaker. Um, so our next speaker is going to be John Beesline, who's going to be uh, virtual. Uh, John is the program director in the Electric Power Research Institute's Energy Systems and Climate Analysis Group. Good morning, everyone. Pleased to share my perspectives on incorporating energy systems modeling into policy design. Um, energy systems, of course, are changing on several fronts. Next slide, please. Uh, including greater rules for wind and solar, uh, new low emitting fuel pathways. Um, there's also more sector coupling, like end use electrification. And really this integration of systems and complexity of choices require advanced models that reflect this changing landscape. Uh, you don't have to understand all the details in this diagram to appreciate how these processes may be more connected than they were in the past, which also means that models are becoming more integrated too. This doesn't necessarily mean having everything in one large kitchen sink model, uh, but potentially linking specialized tools to provide insights. Next slide. And just to pick a couple examples from my group and others on linking tools for decision support and policy design, We've been asked questions uh, like uh, macroeconomic feedbacks about how tax credits, such as those in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, could shape outcomes like interest rates and inflation. Um, my work with Catherine Wolfram and Neil Monrotra showed how even though those effects could be small, uh, the macroeconomic conditions can have pretty significant implications for energy decisions. In the middle, we've also uh, coupled sectoral uh, models with macroeconomic detail and linked those to supply side models. And that's given me a sense for how capturing those differences across households, across markets, uh, across places, can really shape those decisions like electric vehicle deployment. But ultimately, at the bottom, this detail is important for two reasons. Uh, the first is to better capture the underlying dynamics. And the second is really to answer questions that decision makers have. Uh, information is only valuable if it's going to change your decision, as others have mentioned. So research in this space often aims to understand the conditions where that type of detail can, can matter. And on the next slide, although complex models aren't always better, uh, that extra degree of detail can be important for accuracy and actionable insights. So I've led uh, policy analysis in the power sector where the extent and the resolution of models can be first order drivers of outputs. These panels show how there are different types of models that vary in their temporal, their spatial, and their sectoral detail. But there's often a trade-off here uh, between the extent of what's modeled and the degree of detail of that representation. That's reflected here in the, the downward sloping panels. And for each, uh, studies can have materially different decisions uh, and conclusions depending on details of, of the model and how it's applied, uh, including the temporal uh, resolution, how that can affect Inflation Reduction Act investments, uh, how spatial resolution can change uh, assessments of emissions leakage, or how sector coupling can change uh, 45V hydrogen tax credit analysis. But on the next slide, uh, detail can also help to quantify trade-offs for decision makers too. And this slide uh, shows just an example of a recent study using EPRI's regen model uh, to quantify trade-offs across different policy outcomes, things like um, economy-wide emissions, fiscal costs, uh, revenues to the government, and also the average abatement costs. And these um, what-if scenarios really help to provide insights about the relative magnitudes of changes, also highlight uh, non-obvious system interactions. And so, for instance, here it's fairly intuitive that there's a tension between emissions reductions and fiscal costs. Uh, so, for instance, an IRA repeal uh, might lead to the lowest government costs, but also to the highest emissions. Uh, but what may be less obvious is that even though adding a carbon fee to IRA has the greatest emissions reductions, it also has among the, the larger IRA outlays since it encourages the use of those subsidized resources. But at the same time, it's also raising revenues uh, that could more than offset those costs. Uh, so um, the final slide, just to wrap up, uh, there's five key learnings here in research needs, which I hope to discuss more during the, the Q&A. Uh, the first is linking tools, uh, where I think we can do a, a better job as well on retrospective analysis. 
I think as modelers, we spend um, uh, or we could, could spend more time learning uh, about what can be improved, uh, not just in the analysis, we have but more also minutes, in communications, as, as Kate mentioned. Uh, the second is more modular uh, models that really help to facilitate uncertainty analysis, which is integral here. Uh, the third is microeconomic modeling with households and, and firm perspectives, and hopefully aligning empirical work with structural models of the type that, that I've uh, talked about. Um, the uh, the third or, or the fourth is policy design. Uh, it's important, of course, for shaping outcomes, uh, but find that novel proposals are often stretching uh, analytical capabilities. And then finally, multi-model comparisons can really improve tools and provide robust insights. Uh, but here, it's often hard to interpret differences uh, across models. So I think more work can can be done on that front. So thanks for your attention, and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, John. Uh, our next presenter is also going to be uh, virtual. Uh, David Hemus is the UBS Foundation Associate Professor of Economics of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Zurich. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me uh, today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how to integrate innovation in uh, climate macroeconomic models. Um, the starting point from this is that most climate models actually consider the trajectory of technological progress as completely exogenous. We make assumption about what's going to happen, and then we see, uh, you know, based on this assumption, how, uh, say, a carbon tax, for instance, is going to lead to a different level of emissions reduction. But in reality, we now have a lot of empirical evidence that shows that the direction of innovation is endogenous and is going to respond to economic incentives and potentially to policies. Here I have uh, three figures that come from three different studies. The first one looks at the effect of fossil fuel prices on innovation in the car industry. And you know, the big headline number is that a 10% increase in uh, um, gas prices leads to 10% more patents in electric or hybrid vehicles. The second paper here looks at the effect of the introduction of the cap and trade system between uh, in, in, in Europe on uh, low carbon emissions. It compares firms that are affected by the cap and trade system to other firms that are very similar, but for uh, details of regulations are not affected and find that those firms, the affected firms started uh, innovating much more, even though at the time the carbon price was very low, below $10. Uh, $10. And the last paper, looks at the effect of the Montreal Protocol on innovation uh, for CFC substitute. And you, know, so you can see it's a blue, dark blue line showing a huge increase uh, in CFC substitute after the Montreal Protocol. So the goal of my work has been to try to integrate endogenous innovation in, in climate model. So next, uh, next slide, please. So you know, to really summarize this model in the simplest possible way, imagine that you can produce a good, let's say energy, you can produce it in a clean way, or you can produce it in a dirty way. If you produce it in a dirty way, that's you're going to generate emissions, affect the climate, uh, which affects production consumers. Uh, but what you can do is that you can uh, you know, target your R&D effort either to the clean uh, version of the good or to the dirty version of the good. And in, less if, in, you know, in an economy, what where R&D efforts are going to be directed without any type of government intervention is typically where you're going to get uh, the largest profits. Okay, so could you, uh, next slide, please. So what do we learn from this type of model? Well, the first thing that we learned that there is typically past dependence in innovation. So imagine that we relied a lot on fossil fuels to produce energy, then that means that the market for further innovation on fossil fuel technology is going to be very large. There are a lot of power plants that can, add, uh, you know, that can adapt uh, our innovation. So without government intervention, we should not be surprised if clean technologies have a hard time uh, developing. Um, the second is that actually delaying intervention is going to be particularly costly. So if you really want to rely on technology, you should not wait for technology to happen. On the other hand, the more you're going to wait, the you know, later technology is going to arrive and therefore the more costly is going to be the intervention. The, the third lesson is that actually, you know, economists have a tendency to really emphasize carbon pricing, but in this model, carbon pricing is very important, but it's not the only thing you need to do. You also have knowledge externalities, and therefore you should also try to directly subsidize clean innovation. So, you know, if using both types of instrument. This is true for developing substitute, but uh, to fossil fuel, but it's not true, for instance, to uh, 
for the development of energy saving innovation, where we could think that carbon pricing, we should be able to do most, uh, most of the job. If you embed these models in a more uh, international framework, then you're going to see that, that you're going to have an, ad an additional argument for some form of green industrial policy uh, in order to avoid uh, avoid leakage. And I'll skip the last two. We have uh, one minute left. Time. So next, uh, next slide. Uh, so what is next within this framework? I think one important aspect is uh, you know, trying to integrate this model in quantitative frameworks. It's difficult uh, because it's hard to you know, model uh, knowledge spillovers, for instance. Political economy questions, that's also something uh, that we've, uh, that uh, previous, uh, the two previous speakers have discussed. Um, thinking about types of innovation that go beyond what we call factor augmented technical change. So for instance, uh, you know, taking into account uh, supply chains, which is what we do in, in an ongoing work. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. So just to take stock, so what basically we, we, we show in this model that the direction of innovation is endogenous and responds to economic incentives, uh, that this type of model are going to bring new insights uh, on climate policy, and particularly that on top of carbon pricing, you actually need to directly subsidize uh, clean technologies. Thank you, David. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, U.S. perspectives over the last day and a half. And um, so transitioning towards our next panel, which is going to be more on a global perspective, we're going to get a hint of the global pr pr perspective here uh, with Stefan Hallgate, who is the senior climate change advisor of the World Bank Bank's climate change group. Thank you. Thank you so much. So five minutes for the rest of the world. Um, I'll, I'll try to make it fit. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to, uh, to summarize here in five minutes is the result of a work that we started at the World Bank three years ago, uh, trying to bring what we were doing on development and development finance and what we were doing in climate action uh, together so that instead of having basically two buckets of action, we would have just one resilient low emission development path that we could support. And we have published them for about 45 countries now. Uh, the things that are really important are first that those reports are all completely bottom up, uh, which means that we're doing separate work in all countries. So it's very different from what you find in the uh, IPCC global models, which are global models. Here, we're really looking at each uh, country individually. And I think it, it's, it's relevant for our conversation because it means that the scenarios we're looking at are designed at the country level so that they get traction with the political economy in the country. And the level of ambition is not forced by a global goal, but it's really our team in countries deciding what can fly in a country. Um, and the other thing that are really important is that we're trying to make those reports not modeling reports, but getting the interpretation from the experts using the modeling results. But we're really trying to fight against this tendency to just look at the modeling results and to make that the headline. Uh, we really try to combine qualitative and, and quantitative work here. So if you move to the, to the next slide, um, just to give you an, an example of, of how that would work. Uh, I mean, I'm an economist. Economists love to reinvent the wheel. We're trying not to do that in that case. Uh, so we're really working with experts in each of the sectors. So we have the energy experts and they do energy modeling. We have the transport expert and they are doing transport uh, modeling. We're trying to get those sectoral roadmaps from all of the sectors and to combine what they find in this uh, impossible to read table that you have on the right here. Uh, that's basically combined from the sectoral roadmaps, the level of investments, the economic costs and the economic benefits that come from independent sectoral studies. And then our goal is to take that and in the next slide, put it in a macroeconomic model. But this is really soft linking, right? We don't have one macro model that would include the, the economic, the energy modeling or the transport modeling. Um, the value of doing that is that at the sectoral level, it's not only about carbon pricing or even the price signals, but those models have much more of the set of policies, including innovation, including regulations, including direct investments. But then what we're trying to do with the macro model is to check the feasibility when you take all of those sectors together you take all of the roadmaps together, can the country afford it? And also to try to highlight issues like where will the money come from and what are the in interactions between sectors? So very briefly, we take the macro model and we remove the sectors that we have a roadmap for. 
And we basically force the economic model to follow what the roadmaps are saying. And so it's sort of a forced macroeconomic modeling that we're doing here. One important thing is there is no real optimization there because we're taking those blocks from different places. So the way we're looking at this is, here is a good scenario that achieves your development goal and your climate objectives together. And this is what it would take. But we're never pretending that this is the optimal pathway because with different blocks connected like this, it's just not possible to do that. And also because nobody knows what's optimal anyway. So we're really trying to work based on, based on scenarios. Uh, what you see on the right here is the type of results we find, and we do a lot of uh, sensitivity analysis, especially on the macro. Uh, and just give you a sense, one of the big um, things that affects the macro results are the ability of workers to shift across sectors, so the, how the labor market works. And we know there are a lot of uncertainties there, but also a lot of policies we can implement to make it work better. And second, where will the investment come from? And we do different runs um, assuming that the savings are endogenous and can increase because we have- uh, We have a little bit less than one minute left. Good. Uh, all scenarios where the savings are fixed and, and we have crowding out. Every time you invest in something climate related, you have not to invest in something else. And that really affects what's happening on the, uh, on the economics. And last slide, please. Um, so basically we've been doing that in all of the, of the countries sectors, and then we're looking at the macro, and then we're trying to extract what matters for those countries. And so you see on the left, the emission scenarios, in the middle, how, many, how much investment you need, and on the right, what it would do for GDP growth and for the consumption of, uh, of households. We find that in most countries, we have a gain in terms of GDP growth, even though things are not as good for consumption because you have to invest more, so you need to invest. The point that's really important politically is our baseline is not a perfect scenario without climate change. Our baseline is what's going on in countries. And I feel the communication sometimes makes that really difficult because if you take a baseline that would be everything perfect in the country except climate, um, you're not talking to the real problems in the countries. So that's a big choice that we've been making. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a reminder to put your questions into Slido. I know I have a lot of uh, questions and comments, but I'm going to defer to Diego to kickstart our uh, conversation. Fantastic. Thanks so much again to all the speakers for great presentations. Um, let me start by uh, one question using my moderator prerogative, <laughs> and it's related to what um, John touched upon in his presentation. And my question relates to the fact there is a trade-off in modeling between realism and transparency, right? So we tend to have bigger and bigger models, but then it's very difficult to understand what's really going on. So I was wondering the views of the speakers, what are the best practices to guide how much detail we really need? I would say that from my experience building these structural energy systems models is that uh, that modular approach where you're able to vary things like the, the temporal resolution of the model, like the number of time segments you have for, for dispatch or the spatial resolution, um, that tends to allow you to uh, run these, these scenarios to understand you know, how much detail is, is needed in order to change the, the decision. Um, I think you also alluded to the fact that as you build these models with more and more detail, you have additional parameters that you need to estimate and that uncertainty uh, compounds. Uh, so that's another uh, ch challenge that we, we find a, as well um, that maybe suggests that running additional scenarios to explore uh, th those, uh, those parameters are important, uh, whether that's on the technology side, on the market side, on the consumer preference side. Um, again, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, to sort of transfer best practices um, from uh, the empirical uh, world. Uh, there's a lot of good econometric studies that can help to inform uh, the, the modeling and maybe help to, to inform this choice between the degree of detail that's important uh, versus the, the sort of transparency. Where you please, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, John. Yeah, I agree with what uh, all the things John said. I think the other thing I want to add is that I do think making models more complicated is the means, but not the goal. 
And especially when, like in some of my work, when we're thinking about institutions, we need to be very careful about what you actually put into the model. Because you have a model where you model the physical system on the one hand, there are equations about how your CO2 emissions are going to influence that carbon cycle as a result influence the global warming. On the other hand, you try to put in a model, for example, how public opinion is going to influence what kind of policies get adopted. And there's a real risk here because they are all like numbers and equations in the model. And you wanna make sure that you build a model at the end of the day as a balanced representation of your physical system and the human system. So the approach we usually take is take a sequential approach. We start with a simpler version of the modeling before we start to say, hey, do, do we have robust understanding of the empirical foundation so that we can take the next more ambitious step to really do the model coupling and a better representation. Thanks, Wei. David, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think, you know, I may be rephrasing a little bit what, uh, what has been said, but I think it depends a lot on what you want to do with your model. If the goal is to kind of get new insight uh, about new, in our case, you know, economic forces, then you want to have the model that's going to be as stripped down as possible to really understand what happens, right? You don't want to put something new in a big model and get weird results and it's all black box and you have no idea why it looks like that. But then once you figure out, once you understand well these economic forces, if you want to have you know, more quantitative results, then it makes sense to now plug that you know, additional thing you've done into a bigger, uh, into a bigger model. Excellent, Stefan, do you want to add? Okay, so then let's, I have yeah, question. please, yeah. Um, so I'm only going to ask, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to uh, limit myself to one. Um, so it, uh, I run up to into data challenges a lot in modeling. Um, those data challenges could be lack of good data in terms of industrial sector, energy use. Um, for example, there's a policy proposal on the Hill to um, implement a tax on industrial sector uh consumption, so whether it's produced in the U.S. or produced abroad by Senator Whitehouse, and it requires uh, a tax on emissions above an emissions intensities threshold. And we don't have that data publicly. <laughs> we have emissions data, but we don't have output data. And so that's a real data challenge in being able to understand the effects of this policy. So that's just one example that I have, but I wonder if you guys could all weigh in on where you see the data challenges are, where the questions you want to try to answer are limited by the availability of, of data. And we'll start with Stefan. Well, it's that interesting that you note this challenge in the US, because uh, imagine if you don't have this data in the US in countries where like 50% of the economy is informal, uh, the situation is even worse. And we, we are in those discussions now with things like, like CBAM or other trade related climate uh, measures where the data requirements are pretty high. And one of the question is, how do you do these type of things without creating some reporting requirements, especially for small firms in developing countries that in practice would be impossible to meet. And so basically you're, you're basically excluding some exporters just because they cannot re report and, and measure their emissions and not because they are energy intensive. And we have the same issue with the, the regulations on deforestation where it of course will favor countries with a robust uh, land markets and land regulations so that you can really know who owns which piece of land. Even in a country like, like Brazil in the Amazon, you might not know exactly who is owning what part of, of, uh, of the Amazon. And so it's impossible for those countries to report the way, uh, the way we need. So it's a, it's a data gap, but it's not only a data gap. Sometimes it's an institutional gap in countries and the data gap is a result of lacking the right institution in the country to uh, to get this data or even to make this data mean something. If you don't have land ownership, it doesn't mean anything, the, the, the land ownership. Great. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, I, I guess from my perspective, I'll, I'll second um, how in the United States, we're very, very lucky to have the Energy Information Administration. Uh, there's a wealth of data there. Um, that you know all researchers have have access to. I think you know part of the solution um, is the sort of open source and open model uh, co community. Uh, there's been a lot of strides over the last several years uh, in making those data sets more more available. I think the other um, you know sort of solution here is uh, is collaboration. 
Um, I know that that's something that um, you know m many of us uh, on this panel have have benefited uh, from, and things like you know, thinking about climate impacts that brings these kind of interdisciplinary collaborations with uh, climate scientists to help to bring that data um, into in, into our models, uh, both on the supply side and to look at demand side um, impacts. So I think that that's you know all, all the more important as we sort of look ahead to these challenges, um, both policy related. Um, and, you know, sort of systems uh, related that require, you know, a lot of new data that um, either hasn't been made available publicly um, or hasn't been uh, ge generated yet. Yeah, so um, maybe I, I'll try to answer the question in a slightly different way, Mark, because I think you also touched on a very important point, which is um, there are certain policy windows that models can potentially be useful. And then we might not ha really have the right model, right data in order to really answer that question, then what should we do? So my personal take on this is that when there's a policy window, we should embrace it because that's the time when change can make. And then yes, we end up in a situation where we need to embrace whatever tool or data that is available at that point of time to provide the best answer we can give at that time. But we learn something through that process, which is what are the additional data that we need to collect or what are the additional model structure we need to invest in so that next time when the new policy window emerge, we are more prepared, we have the data and we have the model to answer that question. So that to me, there's also a, the, the timing issue between your modeling efforts and data collection effort and when we can make those model results to be useful to the decision makers. David, did you want to add something or? Just I had just one thought that, you know, we, there are sometimes both a lack of, uh, you know, data and I've definitely been confronted with being surprised at how difficult it is to get sometimes, you know, not, not even very disaggregated, but a little bit disaggregated data on uh, sectoral emissions in many countries, for instance. Um, but you also have, you know, in economic models, the need of some you know, parameter for, for your models. So elasticities of substitutions, uh, you know, resp you know different elasticities that measures how the uh, economic model is going to react to policies, um, and that that also we often lack. So for this, you know, we would need uh, more empirical studies that uh, enable you good empirical studies that enable you to to have these parameters. So maybe w one thing I'd like to add is for the for the modeling community that very often when we're proposing a solution and the data is not there. The conclusion is, oh, we need more data. But I think what is also very useful is to try to look at policies that can actually be implemented in a place without the data. Um, and I think this is something that we're really struggling with, with uh, a lot of work looking at policies which might be op optimal or at least very efficient, but are way too complicated for implementation in the countries we're working in. And in the end, very few people working on uh, policies which might not be as efficient, but but can be implemented very easily. Um, and so I, I think it's there is also a risk to just ask all countries to have the data infrastructure of the US. This is not going to happen in the next 30 years. So we have to find other solutions and that might be sacrificing on the efficiency so that it's actually implementable. And so one example I, I use quite a lot is for um, car insurance in South Africa because it was too hard to enforce a mandatory car insurance. What they did is they just took a tax on gasoline to just pay for an insurance for everyone. And yes, it's not as efficient, but it made sense because it was possible to do overnight with the tools that they had. And we need much more of that for climate. Uh, the, seeing a lot of countries looking at uh, uh, emission trading systems at the moment, sometimes it's a little bit scary, right? You have countries with a lot of institutional challenges we know how complicated it is to uh, to manage an ETS. And so you're just like maybe replicating what has been difficult to do in the EU is not the plan A for a country that has a lot of the economy in the informal sector, for instance. So for, for modelers, I think this is a challenge of taking the data landscape as a given and to just fix the policies for the data gaps and not the other way around. Great. So let's now move to the questions from Slido. Um... And the first one is actually related also to feasibility to what Stefan touched upon, and it's about policy feedback. So the idea that policy may alter the political economy of what further policies are acceptable. So is anyone modeling this or do you think this is actually a relevant channel that we should include in our models? 
Yeah, so that's that's something that we have been um, that we have been working on um, in a, in a report last year, where basically what we did was look at the landscape of uh, climate policies from the the, the new Climate Institute uh, climate policy database, looking at um, basically correlation between those policies, and basically the assumption is if we see that in many countries you when you have for instance uh, energy audits you also have uh, energy efficiency standards. If we see those two things together in countries, it means that if you have one of those, you're more likely to be able to implement the second. And so we we apply that to to all countries, and and we we see um, uh, this path dependency in policies. So we can not guess, but we can predict the likelihood of a country implemented one policy based on the policies the country has already. And one other thing that is really interesting with that is you can start to think in terms of policy sequences. So if your goal is a carbon tax, maybe looking at what you have now, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to implement that. But maybe we can look at the intermediate steps and maybe it will start with some monitoring and, uh, of, of emissions and then it will be something in the fiscal uh, side and then you, you get your pathway towards your the policy that you want instead of trying to push from the beginning at the end point which might be out of reach and so the predict the predictability is not great there are a lot of noise and variances and the, the politics we know change very quickly um, so what we think is what we detect with that approach is not so much the politics but it's a lot about the institutions that you need to build an institutional system to get to the point you want uh, you want to reach the politics brings a lot of of, of noise on top of that. So I, I don't know if it's really the answer to that question, but but clearly policies are not independent of the policies that we implemented in the past. Just to add to that, because we have been thinking about similar issues about policy sequencing and feedback in the integrated assessment modeling context. What we have learned so far is that if we just want to represent it as a narrative, that's easy, it's fairly easy to do, right? You can have, you can say that we need to have carers and they need to penetrate enough se sectors before we can int introduce a carbon tax. We can build narrative around that. What is much harder is to get what the political scientists are actually interested in, which is there are political processes that really trigger that feedback or process to occur. For example, two main mechanisms, Jonas talked about that. One is technology innovation, right? The other one is green coalition building. And even in, within that green coalition building, Jonas yesterday also talked about there's electoral coalition and there's also policy coalition and they're different. So in my view, that's where like the modeling is really hard for many reasons. One is that if you're really looking at our models, it's about technologies. It's not about human, it's not about coalitions. So we, in our team, we actually spend a lot of time to say that, hey, this is my primary energy. That's my and Andrew's energy. Like how can I translate that into actual interest groups? And that actually take a lot of time for us to converge. That's one thing. The other thing is there are qualitative theories around how this may work. And there's also some stylized modeling work that people have been doing for policy feedback and um, um, policy feedback and sequencing. But then, then you're looking at integrated assessment model. These are a bunch of power plants. Those are a bunch of industrial facilities. Like how can I turn that stylized and evidence or theory into concrete things about technology and location? We're still struggling on that, but I felt that, you know, uh, hopefully with the community, we can learn more and see what is the right approach to tackle that complexity. Yeah, I guess the only thing that I would add um, yeah, Wei, Wei articulated well the uh, the challenges with endogenizing uh, some of these feedbacks, but I, I do think that um, you know uh, scenario selection uh, you can really think through uh, what some of these pathways might look like, and hopefully uh, helps you inform the decision. But I, I do find that um, you know there is a data gap here uh, when it comes to uh, some of these interactions that can be informed by. Uh, empirical work be informed by data gathering. You know, one example that comes to mind is thinking about the impact of local ordinances uh, on wind and solar build out. Uh, that's something that you know we hear a, a lot on the ground about that being a barrier, uh, but actually quantifying that you know requires a lot of work. Uh, and thankfully, researchers at, at NREL put together a really nice data set of local ordinances with wind and solar. Um, and so I worked together uh, with, with a few of them to uh, incorporate those in a set of scenarios to help to look at, you incorporate that feedback and look at, you know, changes um, over time. You know, how might that um, shape the, the type of technology mix that emerges? How might that shape regional uh, decarbonization strategies? 
and that's not fully closing the loop on you know how does that then change the you know probability that certain um, you know uh, policy pathways o open up, uh, but it does at least quantify you know one of these um, you know so-called barriers uh, and help to understand how that could could change decisions. And yeah, David. Maybe I I would add one thing actually because we I have a a paper with two authors where we we kind of try to think a bit about a mechanism to go to you know from a realistic policy a policy that exists today to something that's going to look like a carbon tax uh, and so then our idea is very simple imagine that you have you're at least able to implement a, an output tax so a tax that then is going to be related to say the average emission so that could be in the trade context for instance right you could have some idea about what are the average emissions uh, embodied in imports of steel from brazil um, but then what we could do on top of that is then offer some form of a voluntary mechanism where firms are going to be able uh, you know, to willingly reveal their emissions. And if they want to reveal their emissions, then they're going to be able to pay less. Then if you do that and then update the default over time, because every time you learn what a firm has done, then you know that the people that have not uh, revealed that emission rate are actually the dodger one, then over time you're going to end up implementing de facto what, what is going to be very close uh, to a carbon tax, possibly, you know, having saved some of the, uh, you know, monitoring and reporting costs that uh, Stefan was mentioning, and also uh, having reduced uh, some form of political uh, opposition to immediately implementing uh, the first best option. Thanks. Um, our next question is from our uh, committee member, Sonia. So she's up here at the table, so I'm gonna let her ask that one. Ask ask her question. Put on the spot. Okay. Uh, my question is: What are the mechanisms and forums through which modelers can interact with policymakers and other external uh, decision makers and present their findings? And do these exchanges have two way flows of information? Information where you're reporting and also receiving information about which questions are needed. Yes, yeah, so, I mean that. That's a little bit where where we sit, right? Trying to get this two way uh, flow, and just just to give you a sense of our experience on that. Uh, so when when we started to do the the RCCDRs, the Country Climate and Development Reports, uh, those those are World Bank Group documents. They are not country documents. They are not endorsed or approved by government. And I think when we created those, we were a bit worried at the beginning that those would be negotiated documents instead of being kind of the, the hard analytics on, on countries. And so we, we started um, working very much internally with, with limited interactions with, uh, with governments and countries. And after the first wave, it was pretty clear that this was not the best way forward and that we would have to find a balance uh, engaging with the governments at the beginning on defining the objectives and not only the climate objectives, but also the development objectives. So in some countries, agriculture is a policy priority. In another one, it will be manufacturing. And if if you your report doesn't resonate with what people are talking about, nobody cares. So you, you have to take that into account. But uh, that I think that really hard job is to have this two-way relationship without getting into a negotiated document that is driven by politics instead of being driven by the data and the, and the modeling, right? So we're, we're trying to get this, this fine line. And I think the ambition of the scenarios we're looking at is a great illustration of that. Uh, when you're working on Turkey and they have a net zero target for 2053, it's very easy to tell them, uh, we will just help you to think through your objective. If, if you're working in Bangladesh and there is no long-term objective on emissions, while well, you have to define your own scenario that's okay with them, but that pushes the boundary. So it cannot be like too easy. And, and this is really the gray area where we're doing this policy dialogue. Last point, which is really important is at the end of the day, if we want anything to be implemented, it has to be a country document. And so once we have published our reports, the next steps are like super important, which is to say, okay, then what do we do? And in some countries, we use that to start an engagement with countries on their long-term strategy. And then it's their document, so we can act upon it. Uh, some countries were not interested in that, and we had in engagements on coal or on agriculture. But the real, really important thing is, if you don't have ownership at the country level, nothing can happen. And so when the report is published, not only during the preparation, but when the report is published, you have to offer something for the next steps. And my experience is the reports that have been the most efficient are the reports that have been 
I'm, I'm talking about the annoying level, right? It, the report needs to be annoying for uh, uh, your counterparts. It's, it shouldn't be like offensive because then you're losing everything. It shouldn't be great because then there's nothing, but it, you know, it needs to just push the, at, the, at the right level. And that's defining that level of annoyance that helps push the questions, open new discussions, open new opportunities is really what we're, uh, what we're after. And, and that's why I, I believe very much in this bottom-up approach where you're doing everything at the country level and then you try to aggregate because you, you can manage this work, which is very difficult with global models. So one thing we've been discussing with Jay a few, a few times is how do we use our tools, right? The, the global models are really important. This bottom-up approach, I think, is also a great complement. Right now, it's almost speaking past each other. And I think one of the things that I would love to hear views about is how do we make those things work better together with the back and forth between the, the top-down and the, and the bottom-up? Does anyone else want to weigh in? I, I'll take a chance to answer that question um, if no one else wants to jump in. I'll just jump in real quick. So what um, at Resources of the Future, one thing we try to do is we try to meet with policymakers as they're thinking about their policies and try to um, hear what they're, you know, instead, you know traditionally, I think in academia is you kind of come up with a policy idea and you come up with this like solution and then you kind of just go pitch it and you're, you're, you try to socialize it and then you try to find the ways people to try to adopt it. But I think another way is, is listening to their needs um, and, and talking to them before the, you know, before the opportunity to do these um, policies. And so like, I know for a fact that people started thinking about our IRA in like 2018, 2019, because they saw an opportunity for reconciliation bill. And they were looking at every single policy that you could possibly find to put into a rec uh, reconciliation bill. And then they started narrowing it down to say, okay, what can we keep? What can we not keep for political reasons, not for political reasons? Does this, how many emissions reductions is this going to buy us? Can we throw that one out for, you know, because Senator X will object to that. And we don't think it's going to actually have that big of a deal. So I think trying to get into some of those early conversations is is facilitates those two-way flows a lot better than trying to come up with an idea and then socialize it the way that academic research has traditionally worked. If I can add a point on that, we we in 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 our work on the political economy, one thing that we highlighted very strongly is there are some countries where you can open with the climate angle and there are some countries where it's not going to fly. Um, and some of the key successes on climate, think of the, the solo uh, in India, for instance. It's, it's great for the climate agenda, but it has never been sold as a climate policy. It's, it's energy access, it's energy security, it's, uh, it's uh, domestic manufacturing or what, whatever you want. But the, 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 the goal on climate should be embedded into the development narrative. And if you look at other countries that have tried, sometimes with a, a political champion, pushing climate too strongly too early, uh, well, it, it survives until the next election or even not even then, and, and it backfires. So what we're really trying to do in, in our report and all of our work is to make sure the, the priorities in terms of development that people have in mind are on three points. And then we, we fold climate into this so that it's also more likely to get to the point where it's not completely dependent on having uh, the right person in power, but it, it needs to be able to survive the next election and the next change in, in, in government. Um, same thing as, as earlier, right? Ad adjusting your work to those realities on the ground is very difficult to do if you're not working at the country level. So it's, uh, it's another reason why it's uh, probably a, a good way forward. Great, let's move on. There is one question by Jim Stock that I also think is very relevant. It's about uncertainty. And he's asking formally, how do the models that we use deal with uncertainty about technology and policy? One approach is to use a deterministic model over different scenarios, but obviously this uh, misses the fact that the presence of uncertainty directly affects the behavior of firms, investors, and households. So curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
I guess maybe I, I'm willing to start here. So I did my uh, dissertation uh, putting together uh, stochastic uh, programming models of energy systems. I think, you know, one thing I, I learned there is that, you know, there's sort of three steps that are hard about making those models that can help to develop hedging strategies. You know, one is uncertainty quantification. Uh, that's something that, you know, is, is uh, hard enough when we're looking at, you know, sort of past uh, data on, say, fuel prices. Uh, but it's especially difficult when you're looking at, you know, consumer behavior and, uh, you know, sort of these policies, uh, policy windows, uh, that it's not just stringency that's varying, uh, but potentially, uh, you know, radically different po policy types. Um, and the sort of middle part about actually making the, the model, that's, you know, what I would say is the, the easy part, um, because the, the third part is really uh, communicating what you've learned. And that part is is very, very challenging when you have a, a complex stochastic programming uh, model. Uh, but I did find that a lot of the insights I was seeing from building that more complicated model, you could probably replicate uh, through uh, sort of well-tailored um, deterministic uh, model runs. Um, and often that's the entry point that I use whenever I was, I was talking with um, broader audiences. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity uh, there to sort of propagate the, the best practices uh, that, you know, a lot of teams have been using for smaller, more, more dedicated models uh, to think through some of those more stochastic um, elements. So this is a great question, and it's particularly relevant when we're thinking about like how things may evolve over time. So there, as John mentioned, there are really different ways you can do it. And one approach we have been uh, trying in my research group is thinking about exploratory modeling with large-scale scenario ensemble. And I, looking at Kate and Jay, I think they have work in this space as well. And the idea we have been thinking is that you know the future is so uncertain and many times it's deeply uncertain. We don't even know the parameter distribution of those things. So the approach we have been taking is that suppose we know that social economics are going to be important, wind and solar is going to be important, CDR is going to be important. Can we really uh, have different levels of each of those categories and then build a scenario ensemble of like 30,000 or even more that help and, and in order to do that and using that large scale scenario ensemble, even though each one scenario is deterministic, what we try to figure out is that can we learn something about what are the key features or what are the key uncertainties that will be most critical for the outcome of interest. Just give you a one concrete example one study we did was looking at the health benefits of from like carbon price because a lot of people are say that hey if you have a carbon price you're going to reduce fossil fuel you're going to have co-benefits um, and that's true and among the 30,000 scenario we did we indeed find like many times this is absolutely true but there is some subset of scenario where we indeed find that if you have carbon price this is going to uh, treat Maybe it's going to increase your bioenergy use, disrupt your land use, et cetera, and create deforestation. And that pathway may lead to an increase in air pollutant emissions as a result health disharm, these benefits from carbon price. So I just want to use that as an example to say that exactly because the future is uncertain, I think there are ways we can combine deterministic modeling with large scale some example and some of the stochastic ways and especially adaptive action so that we can really uh, build that combined understanding of the evolve, evolvement in the human and the physical system. David? Yeah, so actually, you know, when I think it's uncertainty matters much more uh, indeed when innovation is going to be endogenous for the, for the reason that uh, uh, Jim Stark was saying. Um, in fact, and in fact, I haven't seen much there. So once you endogenize uh, Innovation. I haven't seen a model that actually has, you know, endogenous innovation and uh, uncertainty. So often, then it's done with a deterministic scenario and like the type of, you know, robustness analysis and so on. But that doesn't go to what is the key role really played uh, by uncertainty. So to me, that's you know part of the future avenues and things where we need to do more research on. Yes. Great. So if we have identified a research gap, Stefan. <laughs> add something. No, so I think I was hired initially at the World Bank to um, to work on those robust decision making uh, approaches for for decision making, and wow, it has been hard. Um, and 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 I don't think we have much to show because I think the solution is really this type of massive ensembles to just cover the the uncertainty. Um, the endogeneity in um, in innovation is just making everything much more nonlinear. So you you'll have much more bifurcations. And so you really need to explore that space with many scenarios. 
And I think the best we do now is systematically, and that I can sort of enforce, is to look at least at two scenarios on, on the climate uh, part. So we're looking at dry and wet scenarios on the impact side, for instance. Um, but we're very far from being able to, to answer those questions. And, and one thing I see more and more is people using those two scenarios. So you have one an optimistic one and a pessimistic one. And the conclusion is, oh, we're better off in the optimistic one, which is really super useful. Okay. I think if you don't if you don't look at the granularity of, okay, we'll make more progress in that type of technology rather than that type of technology, you can't get where we want to be, which is uh, a policy solution, which is robust to the different set of policies that will be successful. And as we move towards more like industrial and innovation policies where we know that half of what we do will fail, right, by almost by design, I think managing those uncertainties become even more important, managing the portfolio effect where we need at least some of that to be working is even more important. So I, I will keep pushing on those multiple scenarios. The challenge are resources. This is complicated. And the challenge is communication, where when people see lines going all over the place, we might see, oh, it's great because us, this solution is robust. But what people see is you don't know what you're talking about because this is all over the place. And so we, we really have this challenge of communication, of explaining that this is OK if you don't know what the future looks like as long as the policy you're proposing is getting you what you want in, in all or most of those scenarios. But that argument is still a huge challenge with policymakers. They still want some sort of forecast and something that works for that forecast. Okay, so we have about two and a half minutes left and we have two questions that both have seven votes. So I'm gonna ask them both now and ask you guys to do a relatively short response. So choose one and short response. So the first question is, um, David, are your results to say subsidies for US-based R&D boost US GDP growth, or do you see technology spilling over to other countries? Um, is climate innovation more sensitive than other things the government can subsidize? And I'm assuming that means other things that would create different types of innovation. Um, and then the other question is, how do we think about the existing models in the larger literatures on behavioral and socioeconomic responses to climate? Uh, policy, what are the best, easiest ways to engage those diverse communities? And I think this is the, the most interesting part of the question is what could the National Academies do to help? Right, so I, I'll give a short answer to, to you know, the, the subsidy question. Um, well, to some extent that relates a little bit to the previous question because it depends a bit on how, you know, how good is the potential of these technologies and we don't necessarily entirely know. If you start with a more agnostic approach that would say growing clean or growing dirty should not really change the trajectory of, of GDP in the long run, then if you're going to subsidize the clean version, then actually it's probably going to, in the short run, reduce GDP because you're relearning the wheel. You're basically relearning to do something that you've already done. Now, you know, you do that for good reason, right? You do that to avoid climate damage uh, in the future. But, you know, the idea is that because it's green, it's also going to bring uh, economic benefits in the short run is uh, often a little bit uh, too good to be true. There are a few points that may suggest that there may be a little bit of truth. So, for instance, when you look at uh, spillovers in uh, patent data, you can try to do that. Then you find more uh, spillovers associated with newer technologies, and that includes green technologies. So maybe I'll pick up on the second one. Could, yeah, let's just keep it short because we don't want to go too far over. Yeah. So just in, in 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 like in like two minutes, one one other thing that we see when people are looking at uh, acceptability of their policy is to look at the distributional impacts. Uh, sometimes say, oh, that's great because we can compensate the the people losing out of the policy and everybody is is winning and so on. And I think one of the set of evidence from um, psychology, behavioral economics. Uh, social sciences and political sciences is that this is this is not working, um, and it's not working because we see in some reforms like El Salvador 2011 that people benefiting from the reform were opposing it until the reform was implemented and they started to see the benefits. And so, in the design of the policy, it's not enough that you run the numbers and that it's fine, it's progressive, and it, it ticks all of your boxes. The perception of the policies would be really important, um, and and that's why. Uh, Kate, I had a, a question in, in your talk about the, the balance between case studies and modeling, because I think for those things, case studies, are, it's a much easier way of explaining how 
uh, the, the politics or the behavioral aspects will uh, will play a role. And those communities are working with case studies. So if you want to bring them in, they, they need to have something to work with and case studies is a good idea. And for the modeling community, I think it's, an, it's a question, I think, how do modelers make a better use of case studies to inform their model? And it can be soft calibration of their model, but it can also be like having exogenous things that you add to your model to just capture those things that we're not able to, to quantify very well. So I think to me, that's a very important uh, part of the research gap. Uh, unfortunately, we are over time, so I'm going to have to uh, cut uh, John and Wei off from answering the questions. So we want to move to the next session. Um, uh, Jay and Wei are going to moderate the next session on global interactions. So uh, welcome to uh, the session on global interactions. And uh, I thought I'd just preface this with a uh, uh, an intro um, and observe uh, that uh, climate change is the uh, ultimate public goods problem uh, in which no individual, no country, or even a single generation uh, can capture all of the benefits of their actions. Uh, and that puts us in a really uh, tough place. Uh, yet at the same time, the world's a very interactive place, interconnected, and one country's policies and measures actually have influences uh, that extend far beyond their own boundaries. Uh, and so uh, with uh, that introduction, we're going to take up the interplay between the US economy uh, and supply chain and other countries' energy transitions uh, and the global economy uh, in the context of the global energy transition. Uh, we'll explore how the transition is driving significant changes in exports, trade dynamics, foreign investment patterns, uh, and debt uh, sustainability uh, as countries reduce their dependence on fossil fuels, creating risks and opportunities, uh, it will consider the economics and political economy of border adjustments, uh, just for a start. Um, so uh, Wei and I have uh, agreed that I'll provide this introduction. Uh, we'll uh, go back and forth introducing our uh, five uh, panelists uh, today. Um, and uh, each will give us a, a five minute flash talk will ind indicate when there is one minute remaining uh, for each of the speakers. Uh, and then uh, Wei will uh, uh, host the Q&A part. So don't forget to be putting your questions and comments uh, into the Slido. Uh, and so uh, with, uh, with that, um, let me just start by introducing our first uh, flash talk, uh, Ben, uh, 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 so, uh, so, Sovacol, uh, who is the professor of energy, uh, earth and environment at Boston University, uh, where he is the founding director of the Institute for Global Sustainability. So, uh, Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let let the flashing begin, I suppose. Uh, so, yeah, I want to just focus on three points in my esteemed five minutes. And the first is that um, the UK has an industrial decarbonization research innovation center called IDRIC. And as a part of that, we conducted a series of systematic reviews looking at industrial decarbonization. And one of the things we found, if you go to the next slide, is the importance of a socio-technical lens that we view these as not just technical challenges and not even economic challenges, 
but also as an evolving multi-dynamic system that involves each of these elements here. I've just put them for two, refining as well as food and beverages, but they're also similar diagrams for chemicals or cement or ceramics or glass. And I think there are three points about such framing. One is it does show how national economies like the US are still embodied in global markets, technology trends, changing sources of energy. Secondly, is it does show that you need a systemic approach, that if you only focus on one element of the socio-technical system, like technology or advertising or agriculture, you miss the other elements, so you get an incomplete picture. And the last one is it's kind of a nice tool or heuristic that you can use as an analyst to make sure that you always understand not just the technical aspects of industrial decarbonization, but also the cultural aspects, the political aspects, the economic aspects. So it's almost like a checklist or an inventory that is useful for analysis. Um, next slide. Uh, and you can see that that socio-technical view then reveals coupling. So that again, changes in some of the subsectors connected to a particular fuel source like hydrogen, which is very central in US discussions, or in different sectors like cement and concrete, uh, can also co-evolve as well. So now we're broadening not just the socio-technical element, but the multi-scalar nature of industrial decarbonization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this finally then leads, the third point about socio-technical approach is you can find cross-cutting solutions. So you could take something like fluorinated gases, which are these human-made, very potent greenhouse gases like HFC-23 or sulfur hexafluoride. One ton is equivalent to like 22,000 tons of CO2. And it looks really complicated when you see all of the coupling on the left, but it turns out that there are just actually four interventions, better monitoring, better substitute gases, better efficiency improvements, better efforts at waste that can actually decarbonize the entire supply chain. So that socio-technical approach, even though it's complex, can reveal these kind of hidden leverage points that you can then utilize to decarbonize multiple parts of that system at the same time. Next slide. Uh, oh, and this just shows you similarly for cement and concrete, similar number of, of uh, like there's six options here. CCUS, digitalization, better resource efficiency, um, better energy use that can actually decarbonize all parts of the cement and concrete supply chain. Next slide. Two things left. The second point I wanted to make is that even though I am a proud American, I think we can still learn a lot from the United Kingdom. They have an industrial challenge fund, an industrial challenge strategy. And you can see here, I guess you probably need better glasses because the font is small. All of the key industrial decarbonization policies they've implemented in the past five years. And these span not just things that the US has not yet done, like emissions credits and carbon taxes nationwide. It also gives competitiveness support, anticipating things like CBAMs, huge amounts of demonstration funding, huge amounts of deployment for hydrogen and CCS, and even changes in demand side and behavior with, I love this, the first demand side policy introduced, which says energy efficiency first, as you start to consider decarbonization. The next slide. This also shows you the UK roadmap, which looks a bit different than the US roadmap. So this one is much more focused on efficiency first, followed by carbon capture and storage, followed by fuel switching. So again, just a kind of different way of sequencing interventions out to 2050. And the last point I wanted to make, next slide, is in how we structure research. IDRIC is a nice template for what the US could do. IDRIC is meant to be the one-stop shop for industrial decarbonization, next slide. You can see here, they put in 30 million pounds uh, over these six different dimensions, the next slide. Uh, and they have oh, scores of industry partners research organizations. We had 66 projects among 150 investigators and the last slide and our research agenda, which was blissfully multidimensional, looking at not just low carbon technology, but also scale up systems and life cycle assessment, but also social, economic and policy elements, including trust, just transitions, incumbency and social perceptions. And so I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can learn a lot from how the UK has both implemented policy and structured their research on this topic. Thank you, Jay. Right on time. Great. Next, we have uh, Dr. Valerie Coplis. Valerie Coplis is a professor in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University and the Associate Director of the Walton Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. Valerie, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Wei. And it's great to connect with everyone here virtually. I'm teaching, otherwise I would I would be there in person um, uh, these two days. But uh, a lot of what I want to say today actually really echoes uh, some of uh, Benjamin's remarks and observations about the nature of the challenge. Uh, my remarks are going to draw mainly on uh, prior experience and work in progress that is happening now in the Department of Ener Engineering and Public Policy and in the Scott Institute uh, for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University, which is really the university's um, hub uh, for energy uh, uh, research, uh, outreach, and education. And so let me let me start by saying uh, the the four elements that are shown here show uh, dimensions along which we need to be working. Uh, many of them are encompassed by uh, the slides that Benjamin showed as well, uh, both starting with the technology and systems at the atomistic level and working from that, think about the enabling infrastructures, the sector coupling. I think that's a very helpful framing that has been developed and introduced in the UK and, and, um, and uh, in the European Union. I think you really also see um, a lot of interesting, uh, you know, the importance of, of understanding how these transitions are unfolding on the ground in places really goes to the importance of employment in some of these industries for specific communities and locations, as well as the uh, ways that communities interact with existing industrial infrastructure and understand. And actually, it, we've found in many survey uh, um efforts to, to perform individual or community level sort of surveys that um, that there's actually a lot of interest and excitement about industrial decarbonization in particular. Um, and then finally, I think you have to wrap all of this in a, an understanding of in, how incentives can work uh, to make sure we're getting um, the lessons and uh, identifying the solutions um, at the policy level, at the institutional design level, across, working across countries, bilateral relationships, also our complementary policies around trade. And then finally, I'll make a few points um, to wrap up my remarks on organizational design. So we are working in tandem on all of these different fronts um, in projects that connect at least, I would say, two out of these four themes each, and some span all four. Next slide. I'll give you an example of how I think uh, one thing to to add to the to sort of the institution building side, particularly around international collaboration, is the importance of sort of how you can build these linkages globally. And I think there is an argument here to be made that you can work very effectively at the industry level to develop to to basically map and understand how others are thinking. Because when you start to to sort of tackle everything at the sort of single umbrella, um, one size fits all level. I think one of the biggest challenges is being able to identify uh, who should do what, when, and who is doing what, keeping up with all of the developments and all different fronts. So this is an effort funded by the National Science Foundation, involves four investigators at Carnegie Mellon across multiple departments and uh, five campuses across four countries and um, around 20 multi-sector, multi-stakeholder partners. It is largely focused on iron and steel in its first instance. It's used a combination of, in the research, machine learning methods, uh, techno-economic modeling, uh, integrated assessment, and uh, uh, computable general equilibrium modeling uh, to look at, um, through different groups, different lenses, and different research techniques, a lot of the challenges on the ground of addressing uh, those four dimensions of industrial decarbonization that I think have to work in tandem um, in order to make, make progress globally. And we have uh, meetings among this group. We have um, intensive week-long study tours, and we develop uh, those relationships and camaraderie and feed into larger global efforts. So I think a, a network of systems is a very, one minute in our experience, to be a very effective way um, to organize. And then finally, I'll just move to the last slide and sum up some um, general learnings. Uh, and the first comes from our experience of working at the industry level uh, and thinking about supply chains, global supply chains that are connected to these industries and particularly to the focal um, high emitting processes that we need to evolve um, and identifying those, those um, uh, critical levers uh, in those types of studies that can then be brought together um, with national plans and um, form a basis for shared understanding and development of um, international collaboration. The next bullet, please. 
Uh, I think the collaboration is absolutely critical. I would um, uh, argue is that in particular collaboration that spans um, largest emitting countries, especially China and the US, it's been a particular bright spot in um, over the last 10 years, at least, in terms of uh, finding ways to work together and develop shared understandings that lead to greater global ambition. And uh, we hope that um, continued both um, government to government as well as um, academic ties can be built and strengthened um, globally, but in particular in this, in, in this, um, in this, to some extent, I think an important um, safe space, at least at the, in the sort of modeling, planning, and um, addressing some of the challenges uh, associated with uh, decarbonizing in place. And then I'd like to finally emphasize the role of trade policy, which I think is serving as an important climate policy lever, whether it was intended to do so or not. And we need to think about ways that trade policy can be used to accelerate and not impede uh, climate ambition. So with that, I'll end my remarks and look forward to discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next flash talk uh, will be uh, given by Rena Sui, who is the acting director uh, and research director at the Center for Global Sustainability uh, and associate research professor uh, at the University of Maryland's uh, School of Public Policy. So, Rena, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jay, and good morning. Uh, really great pleasure to join the panel. Uh, so the work we do at the Center for Global Sustainability mostly focus on uh, developing high ambition, plausible pathways for key meeting countries, um, uh, including at the sub-national level. And my talk today will focus on China and a few others in, in Asia. And first, first slide, please. I want to start by really showing the emission profiles and trends in, the, uh, in these countries. We already mentioned um, uh, in China, India, Indonesia, emission still growing rapidly, uh, at least until 2022. Um, emission has been declining in Japan, but also uh, has started to decline in South Korea. Uh, but also the sectoral breakdown give a little more context uh, where electricity the, the, uh, in black and, and industry, the, the bright blue are, are uh, dominant carbon emission sources. Uh, where transportation buildings are, are, are much smaller, especially in China, India, compared to the US, uh, just because the different economic structure, development stages, um, different infrastructure and some behavior differences. Um, next slide, please. And for China, they are actually at a critical turning point of the overall emission. Uh, our modeling suggested if uh, China's emission will peak very soon, if not already in last year, uh, this is mostly driven by rapid green technology deployments and also declining demand for um, uh, construction material in real listed uh, due to economic slowdown and restructuring. So how quickly China can reduce emission during the post picking uh, really depends on um, continue the high speed RE deployment, uh, also uh, uh, successfully integrate that into the electricity. Um, so the line charts uh, were showing uh, emission by sector uh, through 2035 under two scenarios, the current policies and also accelerated action. Uh, so you can see uh, industry already declining in recent years, building transport are small. So really the key is to uh, how quickly can um, and, and bend the, the, the curve for electricity. And the red line really showing, um, uh, uh, this is based on the continuation of the 300 gigawatt of solar and wind deployment that happened um, in 2023, um, which covers over 60% of the global total. And continuing that it will really uh, have the electricity emission uh, continue to decline in, in as in the red line. Um, I think this rate will, the high speed will continue because of the, tremendous success that China built in his green technology industries, the so-called new three of solar, EV, and batteries. Next slide, please. 
Um, so just want to also highlight uh, for the other countries, we really observe uh, this resonate uh, other uh, speakers as well. Energy security, industry, economic development are the two main themes uh, for uh, national climate strategy. Um, for example, Japan, Korea pushing very hard on hydrogen plus ammonia, um, despite the economic and emission uncertainties we discussed yesterday. And for Indonesia, they are pushing on nickel mining and processing, but powered by really carbon intensive captive coal plants. Uh, none of these countries are making the uh, deploying uh, renewable and EV at China's level. So there's still a lot, lot of potential. Uh, just for example, the charts, uh, Japan, um, the, the BEV share uh, in Japan, the, the new sales only exceeded 2.3% in last year. Um, which China, Norway uh, exceeded that in 2018 and 2012, and followed by really exponential growth uh, afterwards. Uh, so really, One China's minute. thank you uh, success in um, in the solar and EV manufacturing creates a lot of concerns for other countries' own green industry development. Already seeing increasing challenges to enter the U.S. and EU markets. Uh, but China then have strong interest and motivation to build new markets in, in other developing countries, uh, which could be positive for, for global transition. Um, also, to my view, I don't think US um, it's a U.S. priority to compete with China on global renewable manufacturing, uh, but mostly to protect domestic industry and the supply chain resilience. Um, and the competitive uh, advantages uh, uh, mostly going to focus on high-tech, high-value industries like AI, um, data system, um, um, et cetera. I'll end there, and uh, thank you. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Great. Our next talk is going to be from Milan Alcabod. And Milan Alcabod is a fellow at the Resource for the Future, working on international climate policy and on European climate policies to decarbonize energy intensive industries in particular. And he's with us today. So the floor is yours. Podium is yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, and a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot to. Uh, Ray and, uh, and Jay. Uh, so yes, I'll uh, be talking a little bit about uh, carbon border adjustments. Um, if we go to the first slide, uh, it is a form um, of a tariff, basically a fee on imported goods based on uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that were necessary to produce uh, that good. Um, Tariffs are quite popular, again, um, compared to, say, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we hear a lot about them, also linking to the previous presentation um, in the context of competition with China. Uh, and border measures might also have a, yeah, a little bit of a, a similar role to play there. Um, but the European Union is uh, a front runner uh, in this specific case. Uh, they have already passed a law in 2023 uh, implementing such a system, which I call uh, the Common Border Adjustment Mechanism. Uh, and from 2026 onwards, uh, there will be uh, actual fees applying, provided um, nothing changes until then. There's still a lot of implementing work to be done. Uh, but it's not just uh, the EU. Uh, the UK has an emissions trading system of their own. Uh, they are definitely planning something similar. And also here in the United States, uh, there is bipartisan uh, interest in the idea of um, uh, having some sort of fee associated with uh, the carbon embedded in traded goods. Uh, the most important question uh, is perhaps to ask why. Um, and depending on who you ask, you will get fairly different uh, answers here. Um, I think the most formal legalistic answer is, is that there is a, a risk of carbon leakage and therefore that needs to be mitigated. Um, usually policymakers are a little bit shyer about admitting that what they really care about is protecting industrial competitiveness, whether or not it leads uh, or prevents uh, leakage or not. Uh, so it's really the idea that it has to be a level playing field. And in the case of Europe, uh, there is this emissions trading system in place since 2005. At the moment, uh, European uh, basic industry pays around uh, $75 per ton of carbon. 
uh, and that does create uh, competitive pressures. Um, another way to look at it is that uh, it's more a way to incentivize others to adopt certain policies, such as carbon pricing, or uh, rather look at it from um, distinguishing between production emissions and consumption emissions. And then uh, the border measure would be one way to focus on consumption. Uh, it is a very technical uh, and complicated policy. So um, you have a lot of design elements that matter. Uh, the products uh, and sectors that are included, how to determine the fee, which is very easy if there is a domestic carbon price, because then you want to mirror that. But otherwise, you need to come up with uh, a different rationale, which is a, a question that's relevant in the US debate. Um, but also something that sounds simple, just measuring the embedded carbon uh, is not easy at all. And I think the previous session uh, did a great job at explaining how if um, yeah, you're at a different level of development of your economy and policies, then you might not have the capacity to uh, deliver such data. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the incidence uh, is a very politically sensitive issue as well. Uh, ultimately, consumers tend to pay for tariffs, no matter what uh, politicians prefer to say about it. It is not the foreign country uh, or producer that pays for it, but of course it does have an impact on their market shares. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then there's uh, yeah, a nice political economy dimension. One minute left. And the most interesting part here is the policy spillovers. We do see uh, a wide range of countries also interested in it now. Uh, I think um, yeah, we will soon have a new paper out detailing uh, a few dozen countries that are either expanding existing policies or at least considering uh, explicit carbon pricing for the first time. Uh, but the response might also be in, it, uh, uh, in retaliation and that can be fairly asymmetric. Uh, a final concern is uh, so-called reshuffling and that is uh, that it might be quite easy to dodge uh, and avoid the impact of such a measure simply by saying, well, we have some low carbon production in our country, let's send that to Europe or uh, to the US once they import it. And there are ways to avoid that, but that also has um, yeah, implications for the policy design. And the final point I'll make is that um, revenues are potentially attractive for policymakers. Uh, but they can also create resentment if it's the idea that it's uh, developing countries somehow indirectly sending money to richer countries. Uh, in terms of order of magnitude, you're talking maybe a few billion US dollars a year, which is not insignificant, but also not macroeconomically huge. Um, I'll leave it at that. No. Great, thank you. So our final flash talk uh, will be from Jean-Francois Jean Mercure, uh, who uh, you may or may not realize uh, is the co-chair of this workshop's organizing committee uh, and would have been here uh, making this, uh, the, the, this uh, event uh, had it not been for the uh, unfortunate uh, timing uh, of falling ill on the eve of the workshop. Uh, fortunately, he has recovered sufficiently, uh, so we will be able to at least get his contribution uh, through this flash talk and through this session. So I'm glad you're feeling better and looking forward to hearing from you, Jean-Francois. Hey, um, <clears throat> thanks, Jay. Sorry not to be there in person. Yeah, really uh, bad timing. But anyway, I'm here now. Uh, remotely, um, I wanted to just make a quick comments on um, <clears throat> how countries through their decarbonization affect other countries, and then how these interactions, in fact, shape the uh, partially shape the uh, attitude of countries towards uh, climate policies themselves. So if you move on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> here we're uh, sort of classifying countries according to, to a very simple classification to in order to map the interactions that uh, countries have between themselves during decarbonization. Effectively, uh, countries adopting climate policies affect the economic uh, uh, 
uh, competitiveness of other countries. For instance, if uh, countries uh, uh, decarbonize, they reduce the importation of fossil fuels, which then affects the economics in ex fossil fuel exporting countries. But this is also true with clean tech uh, technologies or uh, critical minerals, where clean tech demands critical minerals, critical mineral producers uh, produce those minerals such that the clean tech producers can export these technologies. So these interactions are not simple, but they do determine uh, a lot uh, what happens economically within countries. So if you move on to the, the next slide, I, I focus here and press a few times, I focus here um, on um, just the economic outcomes of uh, 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 decarbonization only and the, the effect of c consuming less uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, in depending with whether countries are exporters or importers, their uh, uh, economic outcomes are very different. So low carbon investment typically in every country will create jobs and building activity and raise GDP uh, because it's it's building new things possibly at the ex uh, expense of new uh, debt burdens, but it's the decline in fossil fuel uh, production and demand that is reducing uh, uh, production, GDP and jobs. And depending the, on the economic structure, uh, these two things can go both ways, up or down. Um, in large fossil fuel producing countries, it could be really quite uh, disastrous in terms of uh, economic activity to really lose all the, the activity in, in fossil fuel sectors. And the countries at risk, for instance, are uh, Canada, Russia, the US. Um, but then importantly, there's a, a very large trade balance issues where uh, importers uh, improve their trade balance and competitiveness by reducing their imports and spending the money domestically. And that then gets reflected in uh, exporter countries where uh, the loss of exports is really detrimental for, uh, for instance, their intake of foreign currency, which could affect the value of their currency, but uh, and just uh, essentially economic activity uh, domestically. So if you move on to the, the next slide. Uh, here I'm 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 creating a, a sort of a, a climate policy game, if you like, and that's just using a macroeconomic model called uh, E3ME uh, to just explore according to economic structure, and the model is quite detailed in terms of economic structure. What uh, then happens in to different countries, um, and if decisions were hypothetically taken according to GDP outcomes, um, what what that would mean in terms of decisions. Now, traditionally, we we saw this game as as too simple. I think that the prisoner's dilemma a picture where countries have incentive to um, well should should engage in climate policy, but have incentive to defect, uh, given that other countries could defect. I think that that's that we're really past that that sort of a picture of climate policy. In reality, it's much more complicated. So. Uh, you could say fossil importers could unilaterally decide that they stop importing and that's good for their economies, but that affects uh, fossil fuel producers. But you've got two types of fossil fuel producers. You've got the OPEC and you've got the One high minute. cost. Uh, yes, uh, uh, high cost uh, fossil fuel producers. Now, OPEC could unilaterally decide that if uh, production in the future is going to be limited, they would capture that market. If they were to do that, uh, they would uh, uh, they could keep the economic activity for themselves and then send all the costs to the high cost producers. The high cost producers, that's uh, the, the the countries that are less competitive in oil, US, Canada, Russia, lose all of the exports and all of the economic activity, and they can really not do very much about it. So that that's the really level of of uh, power in in the global game. And importantly, I think this shapes. Uh, the, the 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 willingness of countries to to engage with the transition, given what impact it has on on their economy. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Wei to manage our Q and A. Great, thank you. Um, so for this session, we are lucky to have five flash talks compared to four in the other sessions. And because of that, I would like to directly go to the Slido questions. So I've already seen a list of them over there. So I want to start with Sania's question first. Um, this workshop is part of a broader series on the interactions between the macro economy and climate impacts. We're curious to hear your thoughts on the connection between their, this panel, individual topics, and the broader set of the themes. 
Anyone want to start with some reflection on this? Why can't Sonia ask easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just quickly say that I like talking about the co-benefits of industrial decarbonization because that highlights many of the economic reasons to do it beyond climate. So especially if climate is a politicized issue, we'll do industrial decarbonization for the fuel savings, do it for the resilience, do it for the jobs, the innovation, the competitiveness. Um, we did a study looking at four low carbon transitions in Europe and found 128 co-benefits beyond climate mitigation. So I think that might be one thing of like, when we think about macroeconomic impacts, let's think about the broader way that we should be doing this so much that as I tell my students, it's not just a free lunch, it's a free lunch you get paid to eat. Thank you, Benjamin. Anyone else? Maybe I, I could just um, just mention one thing, which is related to sort of the, the border adjustments and, and trade issues. So I think uh, we are, um, as we make decisions about which technologies to support in one country, in this country, in Europe, we need to be thinking about how our requirements of where those uh, those supply chains are located are impacting uh, globally, not just maybe some of the countries we might um, have uh, some geo geopolitical concerns about, but just in general, um, other uh, countries that may be casualties of, of not being able to, to enter global value chains for um, clean energy and participate and develop their own economies and, and do that um, on terms that are also in, locally uh, environmentally sound. And so I think there, there's uh, the, the positive message in this is that we need to be thinking about ways of collaborating and connecting to ensure that um, you know there are high standards and institutions that can um, allow these global linkages to, to thrive and for production to be something that's available. Um, uh, participation broadly in the value chains is something that's available to a broad range of countries. Thank you, Valerie. JF, I think you raised your hand just now. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that uh, implications for countries are very different depending on economic structure, and and then uh, countries will engage on on very very different terms. Uh, but what's emerging really clearly is that some countries lose out and have low economic resilience because they have high concentration of activity in certain high carbon sectors that are becoming at risk by global decarbonization, and economic diversification is for them. The, the trillion dollar question, if you like, uh, whereas other countries are already quite di di diversified and will not face quite the same challenge and may be facing more a question of protectors pr trying to protect their own domestic industries and then will have a different approach to policy. I think it's it's quite important to really understand why countries currently are uh, headed towards increasing um, uh, the, uh, to, to increasingly towards uh, industrial policy or protectionism and that because there is a global race and it's very competitive and there will be just a few winners in in uh, a new uh, clean tech and this is where the, the the future wealth is going to be thank you rita and milan anything to add just a, a quick point on industrial decarbonization um it really depends on um it, how optimistic you are about certain technologies uh but then there will be huge implications about the geographies that will be the most advantaged um for future low carbon production probably very different from the ones today and might not even be in uh, the same continental balance uh, i think that might have an interesting um interaction with uh, say uh, some of the modeling as well i mean ccs is usually uh, an easy sort of residual technology uh, but if, if you assume a little bit more optimism about uh, deep uh, industrial electrification that might be less sensitive to uh, location at least infrastructure wise rena yeah i'll just quickly add, I think for, for a lot of the developing countries, although they will suffer a lot of the climate impact um, to the economy, but I don't think it's the highest priority on their agenda. It's more kind of thinking about the economic development uh, during the transition. So I, I do feel like the um, from the macro economy level, it's less kind of a being a priority, but I also feel like for the at the individual level, there's more 
kind of a extreme event, for example, that can really relate it to people's daily life, uh, that can be uh, more uh, highlighted in in future for us as as a kind of a emphasizing the importance of the action. Yeah. Great, thank you. This those are all great thoughts. Now I will move on to the sec the next one, uh, and it's a great question. Much of the conversation today has been about framing policy as climate-led or development-led. What are your thoughts on a framing that let both perspectives operate with an emphasis shifting with politics and international relations? It's a very good one, a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take that on? <laughs> JF? Yeah, so uh, often we uh, think climate-led, development-led is is, uh, is 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 at odds with each other, and I I think uh, not necessarily if a country sees industrial development as as well low carbon industrial development as as an opportunity for development, and I think that that has a lot of traction in quite a few countries now. You can think of especially China, obviously, but I think India. Uh, as well, and often climate policy will not be framed as climate policy, uh, but it will be framed as industrial development policy, even though it is uh, green, and that's because it has traction in international trade of technology, and because partly Europe is and US might be consumers, and that to me it makes a whole lot of sense. So it it really makes then sense to engage with countries on that basis, and I would really kind of uh, uh, reiterate Stefan's message earlier uh, in those lines that countries may not necessarily want to frame it that way, but but you, we can engage with them uh, 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 in the way they want uh, to engage those questions. Thank you, JF. I think Benjamin, did you raise your hand just now? Benjamin, then Thanks, Valley. Yeah, uh, I think the idea of reframing both climate action and industrial decarbonization is good because it isn't just about climate or development. It's about a variety of other things. But I'm not sure a geopolitical frame is the best way to go. In my mind, I would say an innovation frame might be really good. You know, this was getting at some of the things mentioned earlier. So the IEA says that there's a hundred trillion dollar opportunity with net zero innovation by 2040. That's equal to one year's gross GDP for the entire world, right? So the IRA is like well less than a trillion in terms of investment, but it could enable the US to capture trillions of dollars of value. And then the other frame that I think is even more compelling is equity and justice. That this is about revitalizing our communities and about making sure that we don't leave areas of our country behind that have been devastated by previous job losses and so forth. And so I think it's very telling that many of the areas most in need of jobs and growth and resilience and energy justice are the same communities where we will do industrial decarbonization. So I think maybe an equity and justice frame, a just transitions frame, might be even more compelling than some geopolitical frame, which is very contested. Valerie? And I, I agree. I mean, framing is important. And this um, equity and energy justice framing, I think, is now being as sort of productively built out in ways that are really tangible and impactful in, in many parts of the world. Uh, so, so that's something to watch. It's not just happening, certainly in the U.S. or or in Europe, but in other places. The the thing I just wanted to raise, though, is that with the framings are one thing. It's we the efforts to understand how different policies are actually influencing the outcomes that we care about is something we need to continue to build out our ability to sense and track uh, because there are unintended consequences of today's tariffs, of today's industrial policies in every part of the world that I think um, are, are far from the policy framing, but very much in the implications of how those policies get played out um, in, different, in different contexts. Do you two have anything to add? Mm -hmm. Also feel like this is a really integrated challenge that it touches on every piece of the society, every piece of the economy. Kind of a, it's hard to separate as a development or climate or you know other issue. It just touch on um, everything. Um, I, I lost my other point, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Benjamin uh, and others that. It's not necessarily an attractive frame. I do think for the moment it has a significant impact on policy choices. Um, one example uh, in which uh, it is also fairly deeply embedded in um, sort of the policy architecture is with uh, the topics uh, of border adjustments. 
um, a lot of countries in uh, emerging uh, or emerging economies are um, accusing the the European Union of uh, not taking account of the UNFCCC principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, uh, saying, well, everyone also by the virtue of the Paris Agreement is allowed to uh, or asked to move at their own speeds and then suddenly our goods uh, have a fee slapped onto them. What is this? Uh, but the retort to that could also be that if uh, some countries need to move faster, then that creates exposures and um, hence we're in this landscape of uh, uh, more de facto protectionist policies. Great. So on that note, I'm going to jump the queue a little bit because there's a question uh, very aligned with what you were saying just now and that's addressed to you, Milan. With the EU CBAN, are other countries' climate policies considered that are different than carbon pricing for giving a discount to the carbon tariff to exporting countries for carbon content? Okay, I... I'm not sure whether I'm getting it entirely correctly. So if there are other ways than come pricing to uh, sort of avoid the charge under the EU CBA. Um, it depends on who you ask, uh, I think. In a way, um, the EU CBAM is very limited in that it will only credit for uh, explicit carbon prices. And that could be considered a fairly you know, restrictive approach. But the other way to look at it is that uh, any importer is asked to provide real data on uh, the embedded carbon uh, in goods and any policy uh, that has successfully reduced uh, the carbon contents of a good will then automatically be taken into account. There's no assumption about what the uh, the carbon intensity of a good is. Um, so two ways to look at it. Great, thank you. Um, now I want to move on to the next question. And I think the question is um, cross-border effects, maybe primarily to JF, but anyone who want to share your thoughts will come to do so. Um, OPEC is key for oil, but what happens to gas will be mostly driven by the US and Qatar. Any thought dif um, differences across fossil fuels in these strategies and what happens to poor oil gas producers? Right, okay, well, on the demand side and the supply side, there are differences. Uh, we use oil mostly for mobility and we use natural gas for industrial processes and heating. So that is, it really is completely different. So diffusion of electric vehicles that affects the oil market, uh, uh, diffusion of other technologies uh, in, in power generation, solar, for instance, that displaces, that displaces coal and natural gas. Um, of course, uh, it's not the same structure internationally. Uh, obviously, the U.S. plays a big role in natural gas and Qatar. Um, and uh, it's possible that there's a, a, a life in, in the gas market longer than the oil markets. Um, but ultimately, I suspect that similar dynamics may, may happen where um, uh, countries that uh, are predominantly gas producers will potentially see stranded assets uh, in a, a nearish future. And if they are insufficiently uh, economically diversified, will will face some some hardship in in transitioning towards a new new economy. Um, so although they are different, I think there are similarities uh, between the oil and, and and gas market. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you, JF. Anyone want to add to this discussion about like how we treat how how markets for different fossil fuels might have different futures? Okay, if now we can move on to the next question, which is on trade policies. Um, in the current context of fragmentation, any thought about how to prevent reshuffling and the risk of dual global trade with clean and dirty goods going to different markets? Unclear that can be easily prevented. Another difficult one. And I can just uh, maybe echo something that Milad said about policy spillovers and how important I think that is in the dynamics around the CBAM. Um, you know, also, I think they're uh, having you know, lead countries that represent various interests and, um, uh, I guess, uh, also stages of development. And you can sort of see this in, in China's efforts now, the draft rules to extend the admissions trading system to aluminum, um, to cement, and to iron steel. 
uh, start to, to provide a template for how uh, this might move beyond, uh, you know, just um, um, Europe and then the climate policies, the subnational policies on carbon pricing in the United States um, and, and the other parts of the world where there have been pricing instruments established. I think if, if I, I agree that the, the prices um, are, are back to the prior question, are, are imp kind of important, visible, and, and hopefully, um, I think, well, ultimately, I think that is the way to, to, um, to connect or, or create a, a global system that, that prevents this kind of shunting of dirty production uh, to certain uh, corners of the world, um, especially, but it's not just about the pricing policy, it's also about um, look, the legitimacy of those companies and those actions in those supply chain contexts. Thank you. Anyone else want to add on this? Yeah. Yeah, I think the the reshuffling question is probably the most pernicious um, one in CBAM policy design. There is one way to avoid it, but it comes with sufficient downsides that I'm not sure whether it's better, but you could just take country averages and then there's no incentive to just um, yeah, prioritize a certain good, but then yeah, you're also penalizing someone who might have genuinely invested in cleaner uh, production. Uh, maybe one way to look at it would be uh, that any jurisdiction thinking about border adjustments should also feel compelled to um, look at which countries are impacted uh, the most directly or indirectly and help um, transfer some of the revenues from uh, these measures to invest in uh, in decarbonization in the most affected sectors. Final point is that in principle, it's not bad if there's a little bit of a yeah, market uh, differentiation between clean and non-clean goods that can really help accelerate uptake as well. Thank you. I want to move on to the next question that is, I think, addressed to all the panelists. Um, the question is, what is the role of shared socioeconomic pathways or SSP in modeling if we want to capture heterogeneity in attitudes or policy, especially trade policy objectives by region? And I probably want to expand the question a little bit. It's not only about SSP, probably if you can respond about modeling and strategies in general, that would be very helpful. Well, I guess as a qualitative social scientist, I would at least resist this obsession over models and SSPs to begin with and call for a broader form of inclusive evidence that includes other research designs. I think these integrated assessment models are great. Some of the people that I work with, including Professor Edmonds, you have some beautiful models, um, but I think that they might be become even too dominant in terms of our kind of climate discourse and the IPCC has been critiqued for relying on them way too much. There are other ways of thinking about climate impacts outside of a model. Sorry to drop that microphone. <laughs> yeah. And I've just, um, I think one of the greatest value of having shared tools and I'll keep it broad as well uh, and, and approaches and evidence bases that, that organize around, maybe it's the, the sort of the sector diagrams that Benjamin showed or uh, buckets of important um, uh, dimensions of these transitions um, and across the board, infrastructure, technology, community, et cetera. The, I think having shared tools and conversations and finding ways to, to build those within um, our bilateral relationships and discussions around climate policy and making sure people are looking at the same tools, looking at the same, I think that models can be helpful in having conversations about assumptions and which assumptions do we disagree over. And I think that is often what comes up in the conversations in global climate policy formulation is, you know, what what's really um, behind a position. And so having models and tools be a part of that conversation, um, as well as qualitative evidence and a broader evidence base in general for how these policies are working and, and um, measuring up is is something that I think we just need to build out um, in in the context and in support of our decision making at the global and national levels. Thank you. Rina? Um, also, I, I think Ben's point is valid and uh, 
That's great. Um, but I also, I want to add a kind of a, as a modeler, I, I know there are a lot of uh, community effort on, on kind of improving the capability of IAM or other models to look at more trade related question. Uh, I think the, the model uh, originally uh, focused a lot on the emission flow and we have some commodity in, in terms of agriculture products, but not all the materials are uh, represented in the model. So there are effort in uh, uh, adding uh, critical mineral flow, for example, into the model. But I think there's also potential if we can uh, link the model with some trade um, uh, model as a first step, as a model coupling, we can also look at more material flow, like a um, uh, uh, kind of a understanding a lot of the the trade dynamic. It just, I feel like it's just like a very important uh, emerging global context as all countries are pushing more industrial policy and thinking about trade in this context, it's just important to uh, kind of a doing more research in this, um, in this space. Great, JF? <clears throat> yeah, um, well, I think that um, the, I am currently don't, really have the detail and structure sufficient that would be sufficient to really study uh, questions around uh, economic structure and interactions between countries and i therefore don't think that ssps really are up to the task of uh, tackling those sorts of questions and we need to go towards models that have a much deeper <clears throat> understanding of economic structure trade and investment, in fact, uh, cross-border investment in particular. Uh, I think we need to study this in a lot more detail. Uh, and I also, uh, I, I think that probably those models are, are, are too much oriented towards a Western perspective uh, and, and optimization perspective of the global economy that is not really uh, representative of, of, of what we see. And so we should really invest in uh, models that uh, better understand those global interactions. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing, and and I, I totally agree that we we want a, a broad uh, suite of of uh, information, and you know there's no way that uh, one size fits all. Uh, but the, the SSPs are really a set of conventions that were originally designed to increase the inclusivity of different parties, and don't require that you have a literal uh, computer code uh, to participate in them. Uh, they're a set of conventions for reference scenarios that don't include uh, policies and measures so that you have a benchmark against which to compare. And we're intended to enable comparison uh, across different modeling platforms um, in a range of uh, of temporal uh, and geospatial uh, resolutions. Uh, so the SSPs, I think, aren't the same as integrated assessment models. And I think we've gotten a little bit confused as to what's what. And so I just want to just make that. And similarly, the RCPs, which are you know a set of conventions about how much we want to uh, impose uh, restrictions on emissions to the atmosphere. Uh, th that uh, uh, have been adopted. So that again, we can do intercomparison uh, so that we can have a broad range of participation uh, and not just integrated assessment models. So I uh, just want to try to take those two pieces apart and I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Jay. Um, so we only have one minute, and one and a half minute left. Um, I want to, instead of go to the question, sorry, there's a great ones. I want to give each of the panelists just 30 seconds to share some of your thoughts from a like, concluding thought from this panel or from the sessions you've heard before. How about we do the opposite sequence of the presentation? So Milan, sorry to put you first, but maybe you can get us started with a 30 seconds concluding thought. Um, <laughs> let me yeah it was a I think a very good discussion uh, and what I really learned a lot about uh, as someone who's well non-economic modeler uh, themselves is um, uh, how much thought that goes into in to 
point to account for um much more um yeah less concrete political or economic societal uh developments and uh, how that is important to yeah uh, improve these exercises i think that's uh, really valuable work um more in policy terms i think um yeah there are a lot of spillovers from all of the policies that are under considerations and um some of them are acknowledged up front but usually not all of them and there's always uh, more work to be done there rena 30 seconds means two sentences <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, also as a non-economist, I, I really appreciate all the discussion uh, in, in uh, the two days. I, I also appreciate kind of the session on global interaction, global perspective, so we can also hear the diverse uh, what's happening across country. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then I think, oh, I, I jumped JF. JF, you should go next. Uh, yeah, well, I think this session helps uh, on better understand and coordinate how we think about climate development and economic development in general. And I think, you know, more should be done in, in that direction. Great, Valerie? Great, yeah, I look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, it's been great to, to connect with this panel specifically. And I think for me, it um, still underscores the importance of considering how country level action could have long-term unintended consequences if we're not also focused on the evolving global landscape and linkages. Benjamin. Yeah, I would say with so much uncertainty over innovations like hydrogen and CCS, as well as the future dynamics of global trade, I go back to the UK's energy efficiency first approach. I think that's a good model. Efficiency has a lot of co-benefits um, and it could be, you know, there are huge opportunities that are domestic that can just create jobs, emission savings, resilience all in one go. So as I say, energy efficiency is the answer. What is the question? Great. <laughs> With that, I want to thank you again to all our panelists. I definitely learned a lot and look forward to continuing the discussion. We're about to have a break, but I want to turn it over to Katrina. She will give us some instructions about lunch and the breakout. Thank you all. I want to echo the great appreciation to all of our panelists and our thoughtful moderation this morning. Um, Annie, could you please pull up the slides? Thank you. Um, so as Wei mentioned, we're now gonna break for lunch. Before then, I wanted to mention we're gonna do our interactive breakout discussions right after lunch. So we're gonna promptly meet back at 1 p.m. So for in-person participants, we'll be meeting back here in the lecture room. Once again, we have lunch set up just outside in the East Court. And for virtual participants, we'll be joining on Zoom. And essentially the idea is we'll be opening four virtual breakout rooms on the four thematic areas on stakeholder needs, research and policy synergy, regional differences and barriers, and academic engagement on global decarbonization. And so uh, for virtual participants, I'll be logging back on to Zoom at 12.55 to give uh, the quick instruction so that we can really start the discussion at one sharp um, so we can make sure everyone can get out on time today and Friday. Thank you all. Welcome back everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us in this exercise. So our plan now is to have each repertoire present for three-ish, maybe up to five minutes. We'll, we'll hope to get through everybody and still have a wrap of time. Um, I'm just gonna go in the order of the list that we provided in the beginning. And how about we start with the virtual and then move to in panel for each. So the first is the stakeholder needs. If we have someone online who could help us. Yes, uh, I'm Bill Dean with Kelly PA, and I was the rapporteur for that group. And uh, we talked about. Is there anyone online of... who is the rapporteur for the stakeholder needs? Yes. I hear yes. you. Bill? Yes, I am. I'll start over again. I'm Bill Dean uh, with Kelly PA. Bill, we can and... see your mouth moving, unfortunately, we... but we can't hear you. We, we, can, we can hear him. Well, some of you can hear, but not everybody, huh? We still can't. Yeah, on online we can hear him, but apparently not in the room. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe 
Bill, if you want to poke around your computer and see if see if it happens to be a, a connection on your end, then I will start with the panel in person it's and then not we'll come Bill. back to you if that's okay. Um, I'm I'm gonna let them know, Bill, that it's not you. Folks online can hear. Yes. Try them again. Okay. Let's try again, Bill. Go ahead. Now I can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> Eric, we heard you there. That was good. That's yes, something. but I can't hear Bill. I heard him before. He's muted. Bill, can you try talking again? Tell us what you have for breakfast. <laughs> or or don't. No. Yeah. Bill, we'll come back. We'll come back to you in just a little bit. We'll we'll start yeah. with the, the front of the room. So sorry. Okay. Uh who was the repertoire for stakeholder needs? I think, this, I think that's me. I can't remember what we were called. I think it's stakeholder names. Uh, okay, so um, we um, we had a, an excellent discussion. Uh, we were asked to give two key takeaways and one research uh, uh, idea, and we decided to um, combine them and make the list longer. So with that in mind, uh, here were our main takeaways. Um, the way the generally speaking, what our, what our, what our questions were about was to think about how, um, decarbonization policies like carrots and sticks affect stakeholders. Um, so we thought a little bit about how decarbonization policies affect decarbonization, but we mostly thought about the economic effects of changes in incentives and such. Uh, and so we thought it's critically important to look community by community and sector by sector in thinking about how decarbonization policies affect stakeholders, but then also to do it both at like the community and the sector and the industry level and such, but also then at one at some point you have to aggregate so you can think about all of the spillovers between communities and between sectors, et cetera, so that you have to, you have to be, you know, uh, have both things going on in your modeling and in your mind. Um, that uh, researchers, uh, are do their best when they communicate the results both transparently and honestly um, about what the policy impacts are that, you know, if some parts of a policy are going to create winners and losers, for example, and being transparently honest about that can then help lead to, and thus we create these other policies uh, to help mitigate those effects. Um, that to create the most successful policies is critically important for everybody involved to understand the priorities. So what are your highest priorities? You might just be laser focused on policies that decarbon decarbonize uh, the most and the fastest, uh, but or you decarbonize the most by some certain date and maybe you don't care about speed, or maybe you also really care about equity. Uh, of you know how those policies affect people or how people are affected by decarbonization. Maybe you would care about who's actually just paying the financial costs of that. And so you have to define essentially what you think is a better state of the world. And that defines your choice set because if you have more, more than one priority, uh, you're gonna constrain your choice set. And so uh, it's critically important to, to be really transparent about all of the priorities that you've laid on the table. And we talked a lot about then how researchers should communicate their results and uh, brainstormed about more and less effective ways of communicating uncertainty. Perfectly at three minutes, thank you. We'll try to go again to Bill. Yes, I switched to my webcam. Does that help? We hear you. Okay, great, thanks. All right. In our group, we talked about several things. Uh, we had a big discussion about who is a stakeholder? What's a stakeholder? And we concluded that somebody who um, whose actions affect others or the, they're affected by others' action in the environment. Yeah, and that could span everybody from a CEO of a corporation who can decide, you know, if they're going to do green stuff to... Uh, Middle school students. Uh, we're in about a a project where middle school students are given these um, um, monitors so they can find out about the air quality in their community, 
and they're becoming uh, environmentally aware, environmental activists. They're they're educating their parents, and they'll be you know lifelong uh, advocates of clean tech and green tech. We also talked about uh, yeah, research in communities. Um, if you're doing it in the community, somebody said communities use scientists as people poking around when they're not supposed to be. So uh, communities need to be involved in research. Uh, somebody needs to uh, go in early and find trusted leaders in the community and work with them and allow the community to help develop you know, the agenda for the, the research project and so forth so that they become cooperative instead of hostile. And there are some good examples of that where the when the community found out what the research was actually doing, they were said, oh, well, this could be really helpful to us. And hey, we want to know about this also. So that, that uh, and connecting with people uh, is important for uh, developing and maintaining trust. And we didn't get very far in coming up with a uh, research proposal. Uh, basically, for those guys, how can we harmonize the definition of transition? Uh, that's going to look different in different places. And so how can we you know, harmonize that across different states and different countries and, and different venues around the world? Excellent. Also perfectly on time. Thank you. We'll turn then to our groups on research and policy synergy. And maybe I'll, again, start with those in person. Awesome. You can all hear me. Um, just sticking to the same format, um, our two key takeaways, one was that we really need to start by framing the research question collaboratively and that by sort of framing it as how do we translate the research, we miss the point that we need to be starting at the beginning with communication and connection and continue that throughout the process. Um, and then the second point that we talked about a lot and that a lot of the different sort of discussions connected back to uh, was how to move beyond an idealized world of modeling. Um, we were specifically talking about economic modeling, but we also talked about how sort of the physical climate science and economic modeling um, are often on different time frames or maybe using different language. So how we get those two disciplines closer together and then also how we integrate uh, political realities, place-based um, specificities, centering people, um, fast tech change, a lot of these things that we maybe don't have great ways to include in our models currently uh, would be really helpful. And then our research question was really more that figuring out how to do this um, sort of very integrated research um, development is the question itself. Um, so maybe that's a cop out, but I think that's actually just how do we do this research better in a more efficient and effective way. Wonderful. Thank you. And online. Hi, uh, Pascal Vail, Fellow Reserve. Um, so we, uh, we came up with the following. So for the first question, uh, what are the most critical research uh, gaps that uh, that need to be addressed to support decarbonization policies in the next decade. Um, this is kind of an am amalgamation of different uh, suggestions. Uh, the the the, uh, it, the the question that we came up with is uh, how to reduce non-financial barriers, uh, for example, social, psychological, cultural, institutional, etc. Uh, and identify enabling actions and frameworks, uh, for example, using AI or otherwise, uh, to implement decarbonization, decarbonization policies. Um, then for the, the second question, uh, how can research be more effectively translated into actionable policy recommendations for achieving climate objectives? Um, 
we came up with the following, uh, which is to engage people that are tasked to be cautious, uh, for example, uh, legal or engineers, uh, and also to engage people uh, who are or may be opposed to climate actions. Um, then our own question, we couldn't really come to, uh, like our own research question, we couldn't really come to a consensus about it, uh, but one, uh, one specific suggestion that was made uh, uh, was about uh, the permanence of uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, like how how permanent or not that, uh, uh, that that is. So that's it from uh, from our side. Thank you. Yep. Much appreciated. Regional differences and barriers. Yeah. Um... Our group discussed the difference between Global North and Global South and the cooperation opportunities and barriers to ensure an equitable decarbonization across the globe. Um, our two key messages is that firstly, it is critical to prioritize the balance between equity and mitigation. And we recognize that each country has their own needs and we respect their um, human well-being. And takeaway number two, uh, Climate, uh, this, is, this is more on the common stuff for the global north and global south. Um, we think that climate migration and critical minerals is a way that to frame the urgent need for decarbonization in both global north and global south. And the research question, uh, point, uh, research question number one, how can we do the, how can we mobilize the international resource to places with lower institutional risks uh, we feel that's critical for global north and south um, coll collaboration. And if we, I may add number two, <laughs> it is how to model some new mechanisms to address the critical minerals, um, equity and um, decarbonization issue. Um, so online, we actually combined the third and fourth topics um, and we had a very diverse group of discussants, including an expert from the Pacific region, also a modeler, an environmental biologist. Um, so we had a very interesting discussion. Um, and so the questions that we focused on were about the regional differences and barriers and thinking about what are key differences in the decarbonization challenges faced by the global north and the global south. Also, how can we address the unique risks and barriers faced by the global south while ensuring equitable access to opportunities in the green economy? And also, what are the barriers for international cooperation to bridge the gap between the global north and south in terms of technology transfer, financing, and capacity building for decarbonization? Um, and so throughout our discussion, one key theme was, also, was first starting out with the first question about this difference between global north and global south, and actually that maybe this, defi this definition isn't so clear. It's not necessarily based on just wealth. Um, it's a difficult but necessary balance to address the big players and little players, both within and also between different countries. Um, and thinking about maybe reframing in that some countries, not just between North and South, but some are more empowered to be able to make more of these decisions that may have more of a moral decision or not just affect only thinking about themselves. Um, some of the key challenges we saw, we talked about throughout our discussion were really about data. Um, and thinking about the granularity challenges and also for how to model the global side and also regional differences. And also a big key theme that came out of the discussion was thinking about how different countries are different, really. So thinking about some may have carry a lot of weight, not just in their wealth, but also they might have more capacities um, to actually collect and measure their data. And they might be the ones really weighing that data that might have more biases. Um, and also making more of the decisions around those data and also the types of indicators that are being made. Um, so uh, we were cautioned that we should be thinking about, are there any biases in also the indicators? Um, but then also there are regions that may be very vulnerable or have smaller populations, um, but actually if you can uh, ensure a just transition in those regions, they might actually carry a lot of weight and actually their impact may be much broader to the global decarbonization effort. So one of those regions we talked about a lot um, as I mentioned, we had an expert on the Pacific region. So a lot of those islands are very small, but if you can ensure a just transition in that area, actually the impact can grow and grow. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And I think this is our final group then on global engagement and decarbonization.
Um, so uh, our group had a discussion on specifically the academic engagement and global decarbonization. And um, the main takeaways are a long list of challenges and then some uh, proposed solutions to address these challenges. Um, but some common themes to these challenges, the first one is how to build trust and make an impact in local communities when academic often act as technical uh, advisors in these uh, research efforts. Uh, the second challenge is that when it comes to making this impact, there's often a trade off between uh, the knowledge generation and making an impact. So there's often a lack of incentives for academics to do work that is interdisciplinary, that has uh, policy implications and social implications, especially when it comes to uh, uh, kind of the, the tenure process and uh, for students who are coming onto jobs, thinking of a disciplinary approach rather than interdisciplinary. Um, and then the third kind of common theme and the challenges are is related to financial support. So had the challenges of finding support to uh, fund the research at the global scale. Uh, the funds are often uh, focused on short term outcomes on uh, impact, which is, again, a mismatch with the academic model. And so one way to address these challenges, we proposed uh, developing ways of co-funding mechanisms that would pair uh, researchers and modeling teams from low income countries and high income countries with a long term vision for building that knowledge capacity in the low income countries. Uh, another proposed solution is to build a network that brings together these regional centers and facilitates the coordination of research efforts uh, globally. And so those, this is for the uh, main takeaways. And our research question is that um, mainly related to, uh, you know, how do we measure the impact of knowledge? Uh, we know that the work we do is impactful uh, and that impact is often indirect, but we don't have a good way to measure the impact of knowledge on the ground. Thank you. That was uh, wonderful. Thank you all for participating. We have approximately 30 minutes left, and this is the time that we're all going to use just to digest some of the key themes and takeaways that we that we pulled out over the last two years, uh, not two years, <laughs> we haven't been together. I mean, I guess the round table two years, but uh, the last two days together. Um, I'm going to call on the committee members for the workshop first, but with no pressure. It's just, if you would like to say something, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll then move to everyone else in the room, both virtually and here presently in the room. So anybody who would like to contribute insights, thoughts, quandaries, anything that really struck you, this is this is our time to digest together. So would anybody, oh, sorry, I should have said, you all can stay up here if you'd like. No, it's really fun to sit in front of the room the whole day. No, okay, okay. You can all sneak off, that's fine. Uh, any committee members, would you like to share any thoughts? Diego, please. Diego has a few slides for us. They got too much time. the slides coming up <laughs> yeah let me just start by saying that i learned a lot over these two days it was really great to hear so many different perspectives on this very pressing problem and i think we've seen that this is really a big big challenge but there are also big opportunities and we are all working hard on potential solutions and in particular on technology uh, there is so much exciting developments uh, how the price of renewables have been coming down the advances in battery technologies that's all fantastic uh, on on carbon capture we're maybe a bit further away uh, than we want but uh, I'm, I'm confident that we can also there have some more technological breakthroughs the the barriers that are maybe more relevant than the technological ones uh, or maybe the socioeconomic ones. That's also something that we discussed today. And particularly today, we have discussed a lot of modeling challenges, but so as an, as an empiricist, I wanted to share more 
uh, what what can we learn from what has been implemented been implemented in practice and for that yeah it would be great yeah now the slides are actually up that's fantastic um so if you can jump to the next slide because i i think there is a lot of uh very exciting developments across the world. So this is from the carbon pricing dashboard by the World Bank, which is a fantastic resource. Uh, they collect information on carbon pricing initiatives across the globe. And you can see there are currently uh, over a hundred uh, implemented uh, instruments across the globe. And I think this is really encouraging. There is really, really happening a lot in this space. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a market that I've worked on extensively. This is the European carbon market. It was established in 2005, covers around 40% of total EU greenhouse gas emissions. And the price currently, I mean, it used to be even 100, now it's still 65. And that's, I mean, not all the way, but close to our SEC, or I mean, at least in the right direction of the current SEC estimates that we that we have, or, or at least use in policy, policy circles. So that's really uh, reassuring. And then if you go to the next slide, we also discussed this today. There is the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which may also incentivize many other countries also to adopt further carbon pricing instruments, which I think is great. So given that um, carbon taxes, this carbon market has been around for decades now, what is the empirical evidence on like their impacts, their effectiveness at reducing emissions and also maybe the economic consequences? So if you go to the next slide, that's something that I've worked on and many other people uh, have as well. And reassuringly, I mean, this sort of confirms with what we also get from the modeling, right? These policies, they have been effective at reducing emissions, uh, but there is a catch. So may also come at at least a short term economic cost, right? And particularly the cost may fall disproportionately on poor households. So the distribution of revenues is key. And I think that's also one thing that we discussed in these two days, the communication of these policies is key, right? That we can communicate that these are policies that are implemented in a way that is fair and equitable. So that's like one of the trade-offs. So if you go to the last slide, in the US, we also had exciting developments, right? So the major climate leg legislation in US history with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but given the fiscal space we have, I'm not sure how many of these we can still afford in the future. So that's why given the, all the action we have globally on carbon pricing, maybe carbon pricing will come back <laughs> on the agenda also in the US. So that's something to stay tuned and be still like excited about. So with that, I, I end and yeah, thanks again for very exciting two days. Thank you, Diego. Uh, feel free to stay here. You don't have to run away. <laughs> would, it, would other committee members like to offer any thoughts, please? Guess I can just talk from here. Um, the camera's like on the back of my head. <laughs> it's a little strange. Uh, move over. Yeah, uh, everyone just staring at the back of my hair. Um, so I thought it was a, a great workshop. Um, I I definitely um, echo what Diego's last point was, is we have an opportunity um, through the Inflation Reduction Act to actually learn what some of these other types of policies are, are doing. And I think that's going to be something interesting to pay attention to as a research agenda over the next couple of maybe five to 10 years is really being able to try to empirically evaluate how successful some of these things were compared to other things. And I think, honestly, my, my, my impression is that we're going to find a lot of heterogeneity in the uh, cost effectiveness across these policies. Like how much do we really get for the money we spent? So it's going to be really interesting to look at what that um, distribution of outcomes is going to be from all these very different policies that were all part of the IRA. Um, the other thing I just want to comment on, and this is not a critique of where we went with the workshop, but we didn't talk about macroeconomics very much. <laughs> and it was a lot of about, and, you know, I think a lot of it was on like, we didn't talk about inflation very much, maybe a little bit during risks. We didn't talk about jobs very much, you know, kind of the macroeconomic policy, macroeconomic outcomes that policymakers tend to focus on. Um, so as we think about like, and so we talked a lot about like specific risks for specific groups, specific sectors, how you manage those, the barriers that risks to those, those groups pose for maybe successful climate policy um is, is just kind of like thinking back to like when the policymakers are putting this together like they really want to know like what the jobs are and i've done research on this for a number of years and i can say that 
this is a really hard question and it's not something that I feel like we are even close to coming uh, to getting an answer on. And so I think that even though we didn't really talk about jobs very much this, these last two days, I just want to kind of bring that back and say, I think that's still a big research agenda of figuring out um, how to model labor market distortions in a way that actually accurately uh, represents how people can move and transition across places and sectors. And I think there's a lot we can learn from previous disruptions. So like the China trade shock and stuff. And so I think that we could use some of those other um, non-environmental -pol non policy shocks to maybe try to learn something uh, new that we could use to inform uh, how we design uh, environmental policies that are gonna have like the least amount of disruptions within the labor market. Thank you. Other committee members? Wait, go ahead. Yeah, I feel that I learned so much over the past two days, and I just want to make a very quick reflection. I think we talked a lot about research needs over the past two days, but I also had side conversations um, throughout the two days about education. And I do want to bring that up because many of us here not only are researchers, we're also like mentors and teachers in our day-to-day -day job. And I, what I recognize um, in in my own research, mentoring, and also through the workshop is that this is such a complex issue and is so interdisciplinary by nature and it really challenged the way we have been thinking about academic training. And we, if we really wanna enhance the capability of us in a few years, when in, a few in the coming decade to tackle this question better, then we probably should start be thinking about like, how are we training our students today to think about the climate issue? Like, are we thinking about training the economists the way we have been doing in the, in the past? And how should we thinking about the policy school education in this regard? So I just want to throw this idea here because I, I do think that, yeah, there are things we can do today to do better research, but we also want to invest in our education so that in the long run, we have the younger generation who hopefully will be smarter than us to take these questions on. I love that. Thank you. Any others? Jay? Seems like a wise idea to come up here given the, uh, the problem, problem with microphones back there. So I, I, I guess I'd wanna also vote for a great meeting. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Um, and actually, I think one of the great things about a meeting like this isn't just the, the panels and the formal conversations, but actually all of the networking that has gone on here, I think has been a real, you know, re a, a real benefit um, in terms of pushing this whole uh, climate macro field forward. Uh, I guess the, on the optimistic side, I think we've, got, uh, we've learned a lot about the tools that we have available to us. Uh, to inform decision making, uh, that uh, these tools are are many and varied, um, and uh, uh, on, on the negative side, uh, they're they're not um, necessarily uh, ready to be used together, uh, and in the end, we're going to need uh, synthetic knowledge, not one model uh, or one. Uh, you know, one set of models, but rather we need to, to be able to uh, couple these models together uh, to use them in combination uh, so that we get answers to questions that are relevant. And uh, just to echo some of the uh, the comments that uh, we've had already, uh, that we need to do as modelers, we need to do a much better job of uh, modeling the questions that people want uh, answers to. Um, the other thing just to observe coming out of this is that decision makers don't necessarily just want one thing. Uh, they care about lots of different things. And so we need models that aren't just energy models or aren't just agriculture models or aren't just water models, uh, but we need uh, models uh, or at least be able to run them in, in combination 
uh, so that we we uh, we actually get a, a fuller picture of what's going on. And then I guess the final thing that I, I think we need to, to work on is the connectivity. Uh, we need to get a better connection between the decision makers who have questions uh, and the people who have analytical tools that can lead to better decision making. And, and, and I don't know how to get that connectivity going. There are a number of different uh, mechanisms we could uh, discuss and have discussed, I think, uh, today over the course of the last two days. But I think that connectivity uh, is something we do need to prioritize and we do need to work on uh, to, uh, to do a, a much better job than we've done in the past. Thank you, Jay. I'll go ahead now and open the floor to anybody who would like to reflect on the day. And I'll also watch online if you'd like to raise your hand. I told my students the other day that I've become an expert in the very long, awkward wait. <laughs> all teachers know this wait, right? Just sit there for a while. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be awkward with you all for a little bit. Yes, please. Yes, Maybe it's my my usual um, call for the uh, the research in. Uh, especially high income countries to systematically try to just go into what's going on in the in the rest of the world uh and 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 to make it sort of part of the normal assessment when we're looking at policy issues in a country to try in a very systematic manner to just look at what it does for the for the rest of the world positive or or negative um and so we i think we talked about that uh today uh but if you look at the papers being published it it's still not the case. Um, and I feel there is a very big imbalance between what we know in uh, in high income countries on the very little details of all of the policy impacts and 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 what we know for the for the rest of the world. So that might be a call for the when there are call for researcher for for research and and so on to just make sure uh, this is not uh, forgotten, especially in countries that don't have the capacity to do the work themselves. So basically, if uh, if other countries are not looking at that, then we will not even know. So that would be an important uh, thing for me. Thank you. And I've broken the silence, so you're welcome. Any others? Please. Well, um, as a follow up to what uh, Wei was saying about the interdisciplinarity of the issue of uh, decarbonization, one thing that we discussed also in our group that I uh, wanted to bring up is the challenge in disseminating uh, this kind of research to the right audience. Um, because we come from different fields and in decarbonization, this problem is being solved from a technological, social, regulatory, and economic perspective, among others. And so all these disciplines have their own uh, kind of dissemination venues, and we need to make sure to identify ways such as, for example, this workshop or events that are similar to this that bring in people from different disciplines and make sure that the work that we're doing is being disseminated to the right audience to facilitate the implication, the societal implication and the uh, kind of the scale up to the integration in, in the society and practice. Thank you. Do I get the honors of closing this out or is there a hand? I'm missing a hand. Hi. Oh, Bob, please. Hi, sorry, I had to leave early to get to the train station. Uh, what's strike me as we get through the, the last two days, particularly when we talk about how we're doing the science, but even also when we're talking about things like barriers, is how many parallels there are between decarbonization and adaptation. I think these two-step fields are at um, different stages, um, but there's like, I think in terms of thinking about changes of how we're doing the science, I see so many commonalities here, uh, which I wasn't necessarily expecting to think about as a, you know, Thank you for calling in from your Uber. That was great. <laughs> that is true dedication. Yeah. 
Please go ahead online, Professor Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for a really um, interesting set of discussions in a couple of days. Um, having worked at a university from the Global South for the last 12 years, I just want to um, make sure that I articulate what it's like to receive researchers and their expertise from the Global North and underscore the importance of coming at it as a partnership and so that it becomes a true partnership. And I really like the idea that emerged from the academic engagement um, group talking about forming partnerships between those from better resourced universities and academic areas and less well-resourced universities in academic areas. And I think that's a particular area of that it can be hard to design those uh, projects successfully, but when they work, they create tremendous momentum, opportunities and um, capacity for the future. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and close us out unless Katrina, were you planning on it? No, uh, I think we're ready to wrap up if you are. <laughs> sure, sure. Maybe maybe a few thoughts that come straight to mind for me and then I'll turn it to K Katrina if I've missed anything. Um, one, thank you all for your participation, your active participation over the last two days. It's been fabulous. And two, I'd like to take a moment to thank the staff again for their incredible leadership. I understand that recordings will be available there will eventually be proceedings. There's still more proceedings out, maybe a few. Nope, they're all gone because you guys consumed them. And But there is an industrial decarbonization book uh, from a different working group that was here recently. Any other? Nope, you said it all. Uh, thank you everyone again for coming, uh, those in person and virtual. Um, and we're gonna wrap up. Have a great weekend. Thank you.